Chapter 6, Western Europe I. A storm raged in the North Sea, as we approached the coasts of England. But I met the storm with delight. I enjoyed the struggle of our steamer against the furiously rolling waves, and sat for hours on the stem, the foam of the waves dashing into my face. After the two years that I had spent in a gloomy casemate, every fiber of my inner self seemed to be throbbing and eager to enjoy the full intensity of life. My intention was not to stay abroad more than a few weeks or months, just enough time to allow the hue and cry caused by my escape to subside, and also to restore my health a little. I landed under the name of Levishov, the name which I had used in leaving Russia, and avoiding London, where the spies of the Russian embassy would soon have been at my heels, I went first to Edinburgh. It has so happened, however, that I have never returned to Russia. I was soon taken up by the wave of the anarchist movement, which was just then rising in Western Europe. And I felt that I should be more useful in helping that movement to find its proper expression than I could possibly be in Russia. In my mother country I was too well known to carry on an open propaganda, especially among the workers and the peasants. And later on, when the Russian movement became a conspiracy and an armed struggle against the representative of autocracy, all thought of a popular movement was necessarily abandoned. While my own inclinations drew me more and more intensely toward casting in my lot with the laboring and toiling masses. To bring to them such conceptions as would aid them to direct their efforts to the best advantage of all the workers. To deepen and to widen the ideals and principles which will underlie the coming social revolution, to develop these ideals and principles before the workers, not as an order coming from their leaders, but as a result of their own reason. And so to awaken their own initiative, now that they were called upon to appear in the historical arena as the builders of a new, equitable mode of organization of society. This seemed to me as necessary for the development of mankind as anything I could accomplish in Russia at that time. Accordingly, I joined the few men who were working in that direction in Western Europe, relieving those of them who had been broken down by years of hard struggle. When I landed at Hull and went to Edinburgh, I informed but a few friends in Russia and in the Jura Federation of my safe arrival in England. A socialist must always rely upon his own work for his living, and consequently, as soon as I was settled in the Scotch capital, in a small room in the suburbs, I tried to find some work. Among the passengers on board our steamer there was a Norwegian professor, with whom I talked, trying to remember the little that I formerly had known of the Swedish language. He spoke German. But as you speak some Norwegian, he said to me, and are trying to learn it, let us both speak it. You mean Swedish? I ventured to ask. I speak Swedish, don't I? Well, I should say it is rather Norwegian. Surely not Swedish, was his reply. Thus happened to me what happened to one of Jules Verne's heroes, who had learned by mistake Portuguese instead of Spanish. At any rate, I talked a good deal with the professor, let it be in Norwegian, and he gave me a Christiania paper, which contained the reports of the Norwegian North Atlantic Deep Sea Expedition, just returned home. As soon as I was at Edinburgh I wrote a note in English about these explorations, and sent it to Nature, which my brother and I used regularly to read at St. Petersburg from its first appearance. The sub-editor acknowledged the note with thanks, remarking with an extreme leniency, which I have often met with since in England, that my English was, all right, and only required to be made, a little more idiomatic. I may say that I had learned English in Russia, and, with my brother, had translated pages, Philosophy of Geology, and Herbert Spencer's, Principles of Biology. But I had learned it from books, and pronounced it very badly, so that I had the greatest difficulty in making myself understood by my Scotch landlady, her daughter and I used to write on scraps of paper what we had to say to each other. And as I had no idea of idiomatic English, I must have made the most amusing mistakes. I remember, at any rate, protesting once to her, in writing, that it was not a cup of tea that I expected at tea time, but many cups. I am afraid my landlady took me for a glutton, but I must say, by way of apology, that neither in the geological books I had read in English nor in Spencer's biology was there any allusion to such an important matter as tea drinking. I got from Russia the Journal of the Russian Geographical Society, 
and soon began to supply the Times also with occasional paragraphs about Russian geographical explorations. Prijevalsky was at that time in Central Asia, and his progress was followed in England with interest. However, the money I had brought with me was rapidly disappearing, and all my letters to Russia being intercepted, I could not succeed in making my address known to my relatives. So I moved in a few weeks to London, thinking I could find more regular work there. The old refugee, P. L. Lavrov, continued to edit at London his newspaper, Forward. But as I hoped soon to return to Russia, and the editorial office of the Russian paper must have been closely watched by spies, I did not go there. I went, very naturally, to the office of Nature, where I was most cordially received by the sub-editor, Mr. J. Scott Kelty. The editor wanted to increase the column of notes, and found that I wrote them exactly as they were required. A table was consequently assigned me in the office, and scientific reviews in all possible languages were piled upon it. Come every Monday, Mr. Levishoff, I was told, look over these reviews, and if there is any article that strikes you as worthy of notice, write a note, or mark the article, we will send it to a specialist. Mr. Kelty did not know, of course, that I used to rewrite each note three or four times before I dared to submit my English to him. But taking the scientific reviews home, I soon managed very nicely, with my nature notes and my times paragraphs, to get a living. I found that the weekly payment, on Thursday, of the paragraph contributors to the times was an excellent institution. To be sure, there were weeks when there was no interesting news from Prijevalsky, and news from other parts of Russia was not found interesting, in such cases my fare was bread and tea only. One day, however, Mr. Kelty took from the shelves several Russian books, asking me to review them for nature. I looked at the books, and, to my embarrassment, saw that they were my own works on the glacial period and the orography of Asia. My brother had not failed to send them to our favorite nature. I was in great perplexity, and, putting the books into my bag, took them home, to reflect upon the matter. What shall I do with them? I asked myself. I cannot praise them, because they are mine, and I cannot be too sharp on the author, as I hold the views expressed in them. I decided to take them back next day, and explain to Mr. Kelty that, although I had introduced myself under the name of Levishoff, I was the author of these books, and could not review them. Mr. Kelty knew from the papers about Kropotkin's escape, and was very much pleased to discover the refugee safe in England. As to my scruples, he remarked wisely that I need neither scold nor praise the author, but could simply tell the readers what the books were about. From that day a friendship, which still continues, grew up between us. In November or December, 1876, seeing in the letterbox of P. L. Lavrov's paper an invitation for K. To call at the editorial office to receive a letter from Russia, and thinking that the invitation was for me, I called at the office, and soon established friendship with the editor and the younger people who printed the paper. When I called for the first time at the office, my beard shaved and my top hat on, and asked the lady who opened the door, in my very best English, is Mr. Lavrov in? I imagined that no one would ever know who I was, as I had not mentioned my name. It appeared, however, that the lady, who did not know me at all, but well knew my brother while he stayed at Zurich, at once recognized me and ran upstairs to say who the visitor was. I knew you immediately, she said afterwards, by your eyes, which have much in common with those of your brother. That time I did not stay long in England. I had been in lively correspondence with my friend James Guillaume, of the Jura Federation, and as soon as I found some permanent geographical work, which I could do in Switzerland as well as in London, I removed to Switzerland. The letters that I got at last from home told me that I might as well stay abroad, as there was nothing in particular to be done in Russia. A wave of enthusiasm was rolling over the country, at that time, in favor of the Slavonians who had revolted against the age-long Turkish oppression, and my best friends, Sergei, Stepniak, Kelnitz, and several others, had gone to the Balkan Peninsula to join the insurgents. We read, my friends wrote, the correspondence of the daily news about the horrors in Bulgaria, 
we weep at the reading, and go next to enlist either as volunteers in the Balkan insurgents' bands or as nurses. I went to Switzerland, joined the Jura Federation of the International Workingmen's Association, and, following the advice of my Swiss friends, settled in La Chaux de Fonds. 2. The Jura Federation has played an important part in the modern development of socialism. It always happens that after a political party has set before itself a purpose, and has proclaimed that nothing short of the complete attainment of that aim will satisfy it, it divides into two factions. One of them remains what it was, while the other, although it professes not to have changed a word of its previous intentions, accepts some sort of compromise, and gradually, from compromise to compromise, is driven farther from its primitive program, and becomes a party of modest makeshift reform. Such a division had occurred within the International Workingmen's Association. Nothing less than an expropriation of the present owners of land and capital, and a transmission of all that is necessary for the production of wealth to the producers themselves, was the avowed aim of the association at the outset. The workers of all nations were called upon to form their own organizations for a direct struggle against capitalism, to work out the means of socializing the production of wealth and its consumption. And, when they should be ready to do so, to take possession of the necessaries for production, and to control production with no regard to the present political organization, which must undergo a complete reconstruction. The association had thus to be the means for preparing an immense revolution in men's minds, and later on in the very forms of life, a revolution which would open to mankind a new era of progress based upon the solidarity of all. That was the ideal which aroused from their slumber millions of European workers and attracted to the association its best intellectual forces. However, two factions soon developed. When the War of 1870 had ended in a complete defeat of France, and the uprising of the Paris Commune had been crushed, and the draconian laws which were passed against the association excluded the French workers from participation in it. And when, on the other hand, parliamentary rule had been introduced in United Germany, the goal of the radicals since 1848, an effort was made by the Germans to modify the aims and the methods of the whole socialist movement. The conquest of power within the existing states became the watchword of that section, which took the name of social democracy. The first electoral successes of this party at the elections to the German Reichstag aroused great hopes. The number of the Social Democratic deputies having grown from two to seven, and next to nine. It was confidently calculated by otherwise reasonable men that before the end of the century the Social Democrats would have a majority in the German parliament. And would then introduce the socialist, popular state, by means of suitable legislation. The socialist ideal of this party gradually lost the character of something that had to be worked out by the labor organizations themselves, and became state management of the industries, in fact, state socialism, that is, state capitalism. Today, in Switzerland, the efforts of the social democrats are directed in politics toward centralization as against federalism. And in the economic field to promoting the state management of railways and the state monopoly of banking and of the sale of spirits. The state management of the land and of the leading industries, and even of the consumption of riches, would be the next step in a more or less distant future. Gradually, the life and activity of the German Social Democratic Party was subordinated to electoral considerations. Trade unions were treated with contempt and strikes were met with disapproval, because both diverted the attention of the workers from electoral struggles. Every popular outbreak, every revolutionary agitation in any country of Europe, was received in those years by the social democratic leaders with even more animosity than by the capitalist press. In the Latin countries, however, this new departure found but few adherents. The sections and federations of the international remained true to the principles which had prevailed at the foundation of the association. Federalist by their history, hostile to the idea of a centralized state, and possessed of revolutionary traditions, the Latin workers could not follow the evolution of the Germans. The division between the two branches of the socialist movement became apparent immediately after the Franco-German War. The association, as I have already mentioned, had created a governing body in the shape of a general council which resided at London. And the leading spirits of that council being two Germans, Engels and Marx, the council became the stronghold of the new social democratic direction, 
while the inspirers and intellectual leaders of the Latin federations were Bakunin and his friends. The conflict between the Marxists and the Bakunists was not a personal affair. It was the necessary conflict between the principles of federalism and those of centralization, the free commune and the state's paternal rule. The free action of the masses of the people and the betterment of existing capitalist conditions through legislation, a conflict between the Latin spirit and the German Geist, which, after the defeat of France on the battlefield, claimed supremacy in science, politics, philosophy, and in socialism too, representing its own conception of socialism as scientific, while all other interpretations it described as utopian. At the Hague Congress of the International Association, which was held in 1872, the London General Council, by means of a fictitious majority, excluded Bakunin, his friend Guillaume, and even the Jura Federation from the International. But as it was certain that most of what remained then of the International, that is, the Spanish, the Italian, and the Belgian federations, would side with the Jurassians, the Congress tried to dissolve the association. A new general council, composed of a few social democrats, was nominated in New York, where there were no workmen's organizations belonging to the association to control it, and where it has never been heard of since. In the meantime, the Spanish, the Italian, the Belgian, and the Jura federations of the international continued to exist, and to meet as usual, for the next five or six years, in annual international congresses. The Jura Federation, at the time when I came to Switzerland, was the center and the leading voice of the international federations. Bakunin had just died, July 1, 1876, but the federation retained the position it had taken under his impulse. The conditions in France, Spain, and Italy were such that only the maintenance of the revolutionary spirit that had developed amongst the internationalist workers previous to the Franco-German War prevented the governments from taking decisive steps toward crushing the whole labor movement and inaugurating the reign of white terror. It is well known that the re-establishment of a Bourbon monarchy in France was very near becoming an accomplished fact. Marshal McMahon was maintained as president of the republic only in order to prepare for a monarchist restoration. The very day of the solemn entry of Henry V into Paris was settled, and even the harnesses of the horses, adorned with the pretender's crown and initials, were ready. And it is also known that it was only the fact that Gambetta and Clemenceau, the opportunist and the radical, had covered wide portions of France with committees, armed and ready to rise as soon as the coup d'état should be made, which prevented the proposed restoration. But the real strength of those committees was in the workers, many of whom had formerly belonged to the international and had retained the old spirit. Speaking from personal knowledge, I may venture to say that the radical middle class leaders would have hesitated in case of emergency, while the workers would have seized the first opportunity for an uprising which, beginning with the defense of the republic, might have gone farther on in the socialist direction. The same was true in Spain. As soon as the clerical and aristocratic surroundings of the king drove him to turn the screws of reaction, the republicans menaced him with a movement in which they knew, the real fighting element would be the workers. In Catalonia alone there were over 100,000 men in strongly organized trade unions, and more than 80,000 Spaniards belonged to the international, regularly holding congresses, and punctually paying their contributions to the association with a truly Spanish sense of duty. I can speak of these organizations from personal knowledge, gained on the spot, and I know that they were ready to proclaim the United States of Spain, abandon ruling the colonies. And in some of the most advanced regions make serious attempts in the direction of collectivism. It was this permanent menace which prevented the Spanish monarchy from suppressing all the workers' and peasants' organizations, and from inaugurating a frank clerical reaction. Similar conditions prevailed also in Italy. The trade unions in North Italy had not reached the strength they have now. But parts of Italy were honeycombed with international sections and republican groups the monarchy was kept under continual menace of being upset, should the middle-class republicans appeal to the revolutionary elements among the workers. In short, looking back upon these years, from which we are separated now by a quarter of a century, I am firmly persuaded that if Europe did not pass through a period of stern reaction after 1871, this was mainly due to the spirit which was aroused in Western Europe before the Franco-German War, 
and has been maintained since by the anarchist internationalists, the Blanquists, the Mazinians, and the Spanish, Cantonalist, Republicans. Of course, the Marxists, absorbed by their local electoral struggles, knew little of these conditions. Anxious not to draw the thunderbolts of Bismarck upon their heads, and fearing above all that a revolutionary spirit might make its appearance in Germany, and lead to repressions which they were not strong enough to face, they not only repudiated. For tactical purposes, all sympathy with the Western revolutionists, but gradually became inspired with hatred toward the revolutionary spirit, and denounced it with virulence wheresoever it made its appearance. Even when they saw its first signs in Russia. No revolutionary papers could be printed in France at that time, under Marshal McMahon. Even the singing of the Marseillaise was considered a crime. And I was once very much amazed at the terror which seized several of my co-passengers in a train when they heard a few recruits singing the revolutionary song, in May, 1878. Is it permitted again to sing the Marseillaise? They asked one another with anxiety. The French press had consequently no socialist papers. The Spanish papers were very well edited, and some of the manifestos of their congresses were admirable expositions of anarchist socialism. But who knows anything of Spanish ideas outside of Spain? As to the Italian papers they were all short-lived, appearing, disappearing, and reappearing elsewhere under different names. And admirable as some of them were, they did not spread beyond Italy. Consequently, the Jura Federation, with its papers printed in French, became the center for the maintenance and expression in the Latin countries of the spirit which, I repeat it, saved Europe from a very dark period of reaction. And it was also the ground upon which the theoretical conceptions of anarchism were worked out by Bakunin and his followers in a language that was understood all over continental Europe. 3. Quite a number of remarkable men, of different nationalities, nearly all of whom bad been personal friends of Bakunin, belonged at that time to the Jura Federation. The editor of our chief paper, the Bulletin of the Federation, was James Guillaume, a teacher by profession, who belonged to one of the aristocratic families of Neuchâtel. Small, thin, with the stiff appearance and resoluteness of Robespierre, and with a truly golden heart which opened only in the intimacy of friendship, he was a born leader by his phenomenal powers of work and his stern activity. For eight years he fought against all sorts of obstacles to maintain the paper in existence, taking the most active part in every detail of the Federation, till he had to leave Switzerland, where he could find no work whatever. And settled in France, where his name will be quoted some day with the utmost respect in the history of education. Adhemer Schwitzgebel, also a Swiss, was the type of the jovial, lively, clear-sighted French-speaking watchmakers of the Bernese Jura Hills. A watch engraver by trade, he never attempted to abandon his position of manual worker, and, always merry and active, he supported his large family through the severest periods of slack trade and curtailed earnings. His gift of taking a difficult economic or political question, and, after much thought about it, considering it from the working man's point of view, without divesting it of its deepest meaning, was wonderful. He was known far and wide in the mountains, and with the workers of all countries he was a general favorite. His direct counterpart was another Swiss, also a watchmaker, Spichiger. He was a philosopher, slow in both movement and thought, English in his physical aspect. Always trying to get at the full meaning of every fact, and impressing all of us by the justness of the conclusions he reached while he was pondering over all sorts of subjects during his work of scooping out watch lids. Round these three gathered a number of solid, stanch, middle-aged or elderly workmen, passionate lovers of liberty, happy to take part in such a promising movement, and a hundred or so bright young men, also mostly watchmakers. All very independent and affectionate, very lively, and ready to go to any length in self-sacrifice. Several refugees of the Paris Commune had joined the Federation. Elise Reckless, the great geographer, was of their number, a type of the true Puritan in his manner of life, and of the French encyclopedist philosopher of the last century in his mind. The man who inspires others, but never has governed any one, and never will do so, the anarchist whose anarchism is the epitome of his broad, intimate knowledge of the forms of life of mankind under all climates and in all stages of civilization. 
whose books rank among the very best of the century, whose style, of a striking beauty, moves the mind and the conscience. And who, as he enters the office of an anarchist paper, says to the editor, maybe a boy in comparison to himself, tell me what I have to do, and will sit down, like a newspaper subordinate. To fill up a gap of so many lines in the current number of the paper. In the Paris Commune he simply took a rifle and stood in the ranks, and if he invites a contributor to work with him upon a volume of his world-famed geography, and the contributor timidly asks, what have I to do? He replies, here are the books, here is a table. Do as you like. By his side was Lefran Kais, an elderly man, formerly a teacher, who had been thrice in his life an exile, after June, 1848, after Napoleon's coup d'état, and after 1870. An ex-member of the Commune, and consequently one of those who were said to have left Paris carrying away millions in their pockets, he worked as a freight handler at the railway at Lausanne, and was nearly killed in that work. Which required younger shoulders than his. His book on the Paris Commune is the one in which the real historical meaning of that movement was put in its proper light. A communalist, not an anarchist, please, he would say. I cannot work with such fools as you are. And he worked with none but us, because you fools, as he said, are still the men whom I love best. With you one can work and remain oneself. Another ex-member of the Paris Commune who was with us was Pindy, a carpenter from the north of France, an adopted child of Paris. He became widely known at Paris, during a strike supported by the International, for his vigor and bright intelligence, and was elected a member of the Commune, which nominated him commander of the Tillery's Palace. When the Versailles troops entered Paris, shooting their prisoners by the hundred, three men, at least, were shot in different parts of the town, having been mistaken for Pindy. After the fight, however, he was concealed by a brave girl, a seamstress, who saved him by her calmness when the house was searched by the troops, and who afterward became his wife. Only twelve months later they succeeded in leaving Paris unnoticed, and came to Switzerland. Here Pindy learned a saying, at which he became skillful. Spending his days by the side of his red-hot stove, and at night devoting himself passionately to propaganda work. In which he admirably combined the passion of a revolutionist with the good sense and organizing powers characteristic of the Parisian worker. Paul Bruce was then a young doctor, full of mental activity, uproarious, sharp, lively, ready to develop any idea with a geometrical logic to its utmost consequences, powerful in his criticisms of the state and state organization. Finding enough time to edit two papers, in French and in German, to write scores of voluminous letters, to be the soul of a workman's evening party, constantly active in organizing men, with the subtle mind of a true southerner. Among the Italians who collaborated with us in Switzerland, two men whose names stood always associated, and will be remembered in Italy by more than one generation, two close personal friends of Bakunin, were Caffiero and Malatesta. Caffiero was an idealist of the highest and the purest type, who gave his considerable fortune to the cause, and who never after asked himself what he should live upon in the future, a thinker plunged in philosophical speculation. A man who never would harm anyone, and yet took the rifle and marched in the mountains of Benevento, when he and his friends thought that an uprising of a socialist character might be attempted. Were it only to show the people that their uprisings ought to have a deeper meaning than that of a mere revolt against tax collectors. Malatesta was a student of medicine, who had left the medical profession and also his fortune for the sake of the revolution. Full of fire and intelligence, a pure idealist, who all his life, and he is now approaching the age of fifty, has never thought whether he would have a piece of bread for his supper and a bed for the night. Without even so much as a room that he could call his own, he would sell sherbet in the streets of London to get his living, and in the evening write brilliant articles for the Italian papers. Imprisoned in France, released, expelled, recondemned in Italy, confined in an island, escaped, and again in Italy in disguise. Always in the hottest of the struggle, whether it be in Italy or elsewhere, he has persevered in this life for thirty years in succession. And when we meet him again, released from a prison or escaped from an island, we find him just as we saw him last. Always renewing the struggle, with the same love of men, 
the same absence of hatred toward his adversaries and jailers, the same hearty smile for a friend, the same caress for a child. The Russians were few among us, most of them following the German Social Democrats. We had, however, Tchaikovsky, a friend of Herzen, who had left Russia in 1863, a brilliant, elegant, highly intelligent nobleman, a favorite with the workers. Who better than any of the rest of us had what the French call El Oriel du Pupil, the ear of the workers, because he knew how to fire them up by showing them the great part they had to play in rebuilding society. To lift them by holding before them high historical views, to throw a flash of light on the most intricate economic problem, and to electrify them with his earnestness and sincerity. Sokolov, formerly an officer of the Russian general staff, an admirer of Paul Louis Courier for his boldness and of Proudhon for his philosophical ideas, who had made many a socialist in Russia by his review articles, was also with us temporarily. I mention only those who became widely known as writers, or as delegates to congresses, or in some other way. And yet, I ask myself if I ought not rather to speak of those who never committed their names to print, but were as important in the life of the Federation as any one of the writers. Who fought in the ranks, and were always ready to join in any enterprise, never asking whether the work would be grand or small, distinguished or modest, whether it would have great consequences. Or simply result in infinite worry to themselves and their families. I ought also to mention the Germans Werner and Rinka, the Spaniard Albarison, and many others. But I am afraid that these faint sketches of mine may not convey to the reader the same feelings of respect and love with which every one of this little family inspired those who knew him or her personally. 4. Of all the towns of Switzerland that I know, La Chaux-Fons is perhaps the least attractive. It lies on a high plateau entirely devoid of any vegetation, open to bitterly cold winds in the winter, when the snow lies as deep as at Moscow, and melts and falls again as often as at St. Petersburg. But it was important to spread our ideas in that center, and to give more life to the local propaganda Pindi, Spichiger, Albarison, the Blanquists Foray and Jallet were there, and from time to time I could pay visits to Guillaume at Neuchâtel. And to Schwitzkabel in the Valley of Esti. I Meyer. A life full of work that I liked began now for me. We held many meetings, ourselves distributing our announcements in the cafes and the workshops. Once a week we held our section meetings, at which the most animated discussions took place, and we went also to preach anarchism at the gatherings convoked by the political parties. I traveled a good deal, visiting other sections and helping them. During that winter we won the sympathy of many, but our regular work was very much hampered by a crisis in the watch trade. Half the workers were out of work or only partially employed, so that the municipality had to open dining rooms to provide cheap meals at cost price. The cooperative workshop established by the anarchists at La Chaux's Fonds, in which the earnings were divided equally among all the members, had great difficulty in getting work, in spite of its high reputation. And Spichiger had to resort several times to wool combing for an upholsterer, in order to get his living. We all took part, that year, in a manifestation with the red flag at Bern. The wave of reaction spread to Switzerland, and the carrying of the workers' banner was prohibited by the Bern police, in defiance of the constitution. It was necessary, therefore, to show that at least here and there the workers would not have their rights trampled underfoot, and would offer resistance. We all went to Bern on the anniversary of the Paris Commune, to carry the red flag in the streets, notwithstanding the prohibition. Of course there was a collision with the police, in which two comrades received sword cuts and two police officers were rather seriously wounded. But the red flag was carried safe to the hall, where a most animated meeting was held. I hardly need say that the so-called leaders were in the ranks, and fought like all the rest. The trial involved nearly thirty Swiss citizens, all themselves demanding to be prosecuted, and those who had wounded the two police officers coming forward spontaneously to say that they had done it. A great deal of sympathy was won to the cause during the trial, it was understood that all liberties have to be defended jealously, in order not to be lost. The sentences were consequently very light, not exceeding three months' imprisonment. However, the Bern government prohibited the carrying of the red flag anywhere in the canton, 
and the Jura Federation thereupon decided to carry it, in defiance of the prohibition, in St. Imire, where we held our Congress that year. This time most of us were armed, and ready to defend our banner to the last extremity. A body of police had been placed in a square to stop our column. A detachment of the militia was kept in readiness in an adjoining field, under the pretext of target practice, we distinctly heard their shots as we marched through the town. But when our column appeared in the square, and it was judged from its aspect that aggression would result in serious bloodshed, the mayor let us continue our march, undisturbed, to the hall where the meeting was to be held. None of us desired a fight. But the strain of that march, in fighting order, to the sound of a military band, was such that I do not know what feeling prevailed in most of us, during the first moments after we reached the hall, relief at having been spared an undesired fight. Or regret that the fight did not take place. Man is a very complex being. Our main activity, however, was in working out the practical and theoretic aspects of anarchist socialism, and in this direction the Federation has undoubtedly accomplished something that will last. We saw that a new form of society is germinating in the civilized nations, and must take the place of the old one, a society of equals, who will not be compelled to sell their hands and brains to those who choose to employ them in a haphazard way. But who will be able to apply their knowledge and capacities to production, in an organism so constructed as to combine all the efforts for procuring the greatest sum possible of well-being for all, while full? Free scope will be left for every individual initiative. This society will be composed of a multitude of associations, federated for all the purposes which require federation, trade federations for production of all sorts, agricultural, industrial, intellectual, artistic. Communes for consumption, making provision for dwellings, gas works, supplies of food, sanitary arrangements, etc., federations of communes among themselves, and federations of communes with trade organizations. And finally, wider groups covering all the country, or several countries, composed of men who collaborate for the satisfaction of such economic, intellectual, artistic, and moral needs as are not limited to a given territory. All these will combine directly, by means of free agreements between them, just as the railway companies or the postal departments of different countries cooperate now, without having a central railway or postal government. Even though the former are actuated by merely egotistic aims, and the latter belong to different and often hostile states. Or as the meteorologists, the alpine clubs, the lifeboat stations in Great Britain, the cyclists, the teachers, and so on, combine for all sorts of work in common, for intellectual pursuits, or simply for pleasure. There will be full freedom for the development of new forms of production, invention, and organization, individual initiative will be encouraged, and the tendency toward uniformity and centralization will be discouraged. Moreover, this society will not be crystallized into certain unchangeable forms, but will continually modify its aspect, because it will be a living, evolving organism. No need of government will be felt, because free agreement and federation take its place in all those functions which governments consider as theirs at the present time, and because, the causes of conflict being reduced in number. Those conflicts which may still arise can be submitted to arbitration. None of us minimized the importance and magnitude of the change which we looked for. We understood that the current opinions upon the necessity of private ownership in land, factories, mines, dwelling houses, and so on, as the means of securing industrial progress, and of the wage system as the means of compelling men to work, would not soon give way to higher conceptions of socialized ownership and production. We knew that a tedious propaganda and a long succession of struggles, of individual and collective revolts against the now prevailing forms of property holding, of individual self-sacrifice, of partial attempts at reconstruction and partial revolutions, would have to be lived through, before the current ideas upon private ownership would be modified. And we understood also that the prevalent ideas concerning the necessity of authority, in which all of us have been bred, would not and could not be abandoned by civilized mankind all at once. Long years of propaganda and a long succession of partial acts of revolt against authority, as well as a complete revision of the teachings now derived from history, 
would be required before men would perceive that they had been mistaken in attributing to their rulers and their laws what was derived in reality from their own sociable feelings and habits. We knew all that. But we also knew that in preaching reform in both these directions, we should be working with the tide of human progress. When I made a closer acquaintance with the working population and their sympathizers from the better educated classes, I soon realized that they valued their personal freedom even more than they valued their personal well-being. Fifty years ago, the workers were ready to sell their personal liberty to all sorts of rulers, and even to a Caesar, in exchange for a promise of material well-being, but now, this was no longer the case. I saw that the blind faith in elected rulers, even if they were taken from amongst the best leaders of the labor movement, was dying away amongst the Latin workers. We must know first what we want, and then we can do it best ourselves, was an idea which I found widely spread among them, far more widely than is generally believed. The sentence which was put in the statutes of the International Association, the emancipation of the workers must be accomplished by the workers themselves, had met with general sympathy, and had taken root in minds. The sad experience of the Paris Commune only confirmed it. When the insurrection broke out, a considerable number of men belonging to the middle classes themselves were prepared to make, or at least to accept, a new start in the social direction. When my brother and myself, coming from our little room, went out into the streets, Elise Reckless said to me once, we were asked on all sides by people belonging to the wealthier classes, tell us what is to be done. We are ready to try a new start. But we were not yet prepared to make the suggestions. Never before had a government been as fairly representative of all the advanced parties as was the Council of the Commune, elected on the 25th of March, 1871. All shades of revolutionary opinion, Blanquists, Jacobinists, Internationalists, were represented in it in a true proportion. And yet, the workers themselves having no distinct ideas of social reform to impress upon their representatives, the commune government did nothing in that direction. The very fact of having been isolated from the masses and shut up in the Hotel de Ville paralyzed them. For the success of socialism, the ideas of no government, of self-reliance, of free initiative of the individual, of anarchism, in a word, had thus to be preached side by side with those of socialized ownership and production. We certainly foresaw that if full freedom were left to the individual for the expression of his ideas and for action, we should have to face a certain amount of extravagant exaggeration of our principles. I had seen it in the nihilist movement in Russia. But we trusted, and experience has proved that we were right, that social life itself, supported by a frank, open-minded criticism of opinions and actions would be the most effective means for threshing out opinions and for divesting them of the unavoidable exaggerations. We acted, in fact, in accordance with the old saying that freedom remains still the wisest cure for freedom's temporary inconveniences. There is, in mankind, a nucleus of social habits, an inheritance from the past, not yet duly appreciated, which not maintained by coercion and is superior to coercion. Upon it all the progress of mankind is based, and so long as mankind does not begin to deteriorate physically and mentally, it will not be destroyed by any amount of criticism or of occasional revolt against it. These were the opinions in which I grew confirmed more and more in proportion as my experience of men and things increased. We understood at the same time that such a change cannot be produced by the conjectures of one man of genius, that it will not be one man's discovery, but that it must result from the constructive work of the masses. Just as the forms of judicial procedure which were elaborated in the early medieval period, the village community, the guild, the medieval city, and the foundations of international law were worked out by the people. Many of our predecessors had undertaken to picture ideal commonwealths, basing them sometimes upon the principle of authority, and, on some rare occasions, upon the principle of freedom. Robert Owen and Fourier had given the world their ideals of a free, organically developing society, in opposition to the pyramidal ideals which had been copied from the Roman Empire or from the Roman Church. Proudhon had continued their work, and Bakunin, applying his wide and clear understanding of the philosophy of history to the criticism of present institutions, built up while he was demolishing. But all that was preparatory work only. 
the International Workingmen's Association inaugurated a new method of solving the problems of practical sociology by appealing to the workers themselves. The educated men who had joined the association undertook only to enlighten the workers as to what was going on in different countries of the world, to analyze the obtained results, and, later on, to aid them in formulating their conclusions. We did not pretend to evolve an ideal commonwealth out of our theoretical views as to what a society ought to be, but we invited the workers to investigate the causes of the present evils. And in their discussions and congresses to consider the practical aspects of a better social organization than the one we live in. A question raised at an international congress was recommended as a subject of study to all labor unions. In the course of the year it was discussed all over Europe, in the small meetings of the sections, with a full knowledge of the local needs of each trade and each locality. Then the work of the sections was brought before the next Congress of each federation, and finally it was submitted in a more elaborate form to the next International Congress. The structure of the society which we longed for was thus worked out, in theory and practice, from beneath, and the Jura Federation took a large part in the elaboration of the anarchist ideal. For myself, Placed as I was in such favorable conditions, I gradually came to realize that anarchism represents more than a mere mode of action and a mere conception of a free society. That it is part of a philosophy, natural and social, which must be developed in a quite different way from the metaphysical or dialectic methods which have been employed in sciences dealing with man. I saw that it must be treated by the same methods as natural sciences, not, however, on the slippery ground of mere analogies such as Herbert Spencer accepts, but on the solid basis of induction applied to human institutions. And I did my best to accomplish what I could in that direction. V. Two congresses were held in the autumn of 1877 in Belgium, one of the International Workingmen's Association at Verviers, and the other an International Socialist Congress at Ghent. The latter was especially important, as it was known that an attempt would be made by the German Social Democrats to bring all the labor movement of Europe under one organization, subject to a central committee, which would be the old General Council of the International under a new name. It was therefore necessary to preserve the autonomy of the labor organizations in the Latin countries, and we did our best to be well represented at this Congress. I went under the name of Levishoff. Two Germans, the compositor Werner and the engineer Rinka, walked nearly all the distance from Basel to Belgium, and although we were only nine anarchists at Ghent, we succeeded in checking the centralization scheme. Twenty-two years have passed since. A number of international socialist congresses have been held, and at every one of them the same struggle has been renewed. The Social Democrats trying to enlist all the labor movement of Europe under their banner and to bring it under their control, and the anarchists opposing and preventing it. What an amount of wasted force, of bitter words exchanged and efforts divided. Simply because those who have adopted the formula of conquest of power within the existing states do not understand that activity in this direction cannot embody all the socialist movement. From the outset socialism took three independent lines of development, which found their expression in St. Simon, Fourier, and Robert Owen. St. Simonism has developed into social democracy, and Fourierism into anarchism. While Oenism is developing, in England and America, into trade unionism, cooperation, and the so-called municipal socialism, and remains hostile to social democratic state socialism, while it has many points of contact with anarchism. But because of failure to recognize that the three move toward a common goal in three different ways, and that the two latter bring their own precious contribution to human progress. A quarter of a century has been given to endeavors to realize the unrealizable utopia of a unique labor movement of the social democratic pattern. The Ghent Congress ended for me in an unexpected way. Three or four days after it had begun, the Belgian police learned who Levishoff was, and received the order to arrest me for a breach of police regulations which I had committed in giving at the hotel an assumed name. My Belgian friends warned me. They maintained that the clerical ministry which was in power was capable of giving me up to Russia, and insisted upon my leaving the Congress at once. They would not let me return to the hotel. Guillaume barred the way, telling me that I should have to use force against him if I insisted upon returning thither. I had to go with some Ghent comrades, 
and as soon as I joined them, muffled calls and whistling came from all corners of a dark square over which groups of workers were scattered. It all looked very mysterious. At last, after much whispering and subdued whistling, a group of comrades took me under escort to a social democrat worker, with whom I had to spend the night, and who received me, anarchist though I was, in the most touching way as a brother. Next morning I left once more for England, on board a steamer, provoking a number of good-natured smiles from the British Custom House officers, who wanted me to show them my luggage, while I had nothing to show but a small hand bag. I did not stay long in London. In the admirable collections of the British Museum I studied the beginnings of the French Revolution, how revolutions come to break out, but I wanted more activity, and soon went to Paris. A revival of the labor movement was beginning there, after the rigid suppression of the Commune. With the Italian Costa and the few anarchist friends we had among the Paris workers, and with Jules Ged and his colleagues, who were not strict social democrats at that time, we started the first socialist groups. Our beginnings were ridiculously small. Half a dozen of us used to meet in cafes, and when we had an audience of a hundred persons at a meeting we felt happy. No one would have guessed then that two years later the movement would be in full swing. But France has its own ways of development. When a reaction has gained the upper hand, all visible traces of a movement disappear. Those who fight against the current are few. But in some mysterious way, by a sort of invisible infiltration of ideas, the reaction is undermined. A new current sets in, and then it appears, all of a sudden, that the idea which was thought to be dead was there alive, spreading and growing all the time. And as soon as public agitation becomes possible, thousands of adherents, whose existence nobody suspected, come to the front. There are at Paris, old Blanky used to say, 50,000 men who never come to a meeting or to a demonstration. But the moment they feel that the people can appear in the streets to manifest their opinion, they are there to storm the position. So it was then. There were not 20 of us to carry on the movement, not 200 openly to support it. At the first commemoration of the Commune, in March, 1878, we surely were not 200. But two years later the amnesty for the Commune was voted, and the working population of Paris was in the streets to greet the returning communards. It flocked by the thousand to cheer them at the meetings, and the socialist movement took a sudden expansion, carrying with it the radicals. The time had not yet come for that revival, however, and one night in April, 1878, Costa and a French comrade were arrested. A police court condemned them to imprisonment for 18 months as internationalists. I escaped arrest only by mistake. The police wanted Levishov, and went to arrest a Russian student whose name sounded very much like that. I had given my real name, and continued to stay at Paris under that name for another month. Then I was called to Switzerland. 6. During this stay at Paris I made my first acquaintance with Turgenev. He had expressed to our common friend P. L. Lavrov the desire to see me, and, as a true Russian, to celebrate my escape by a small friendly dinner. It was with a feeling almost of worship that I crossed the threshold of his room. If by his sportsman's notebook he rendered to Russia the immense service of throwing odium upon serfdom, I did not know at that time that he took a leading part in Herzen's powerful bell. He has rendered no less service through his later novels. He has shown what the Russian woman is, what treasuries of mind and heart she possesses, what she may be as an inspirer of men, and he has taught us how men who have a real claim to superiority look upon women, how they love. Upon me, and upon thousands of my contemporaries, this part of his teaching made an indelible impression, far more powerful than the best articles upon women's rights. His appearance is well known. Tall, strongly built, the head covered with soft and thick gray hair, he was certainly beautiful. His eyes gleamed with intelligence, not devoid of a touch of humor, and his whole manner testified to that simplicity and absence of affectation which are characteristic of the best Russian writers. His fine head revealed a vast development of brain power, and when he died, and Paul Burt, with Paul Reckless, the surgeon, weighed his brain, it so much surpassed the heaviest brain then known, that of Cuvier reaching something over 2,000 grams, that they would not trust to their scales, 
but got new ones, to repeat the weighing. His talk was especially remarkable. He spoke, as he wrote, in images. When he wanted to develop an idea, he did not resort to arguments, although he was a master in philosophical discussions. He illustrated his idea by a scene presented in a form as beautiful as if it had been taken out of one of his novels. You must have had a great deal of experience in your life amongst Frenchmen, Germans, and other peoples, he said to me once. Have you not remarked that there is a deep, unfathomable chasm between many of their conceptions and the views which we Russians hold on the same subjects, that there are points upon which we can never agree? I replied that I had not noticed such points. Yes, there are some. Here is one of them. One night we were at the first representation of a new play. I was in a box with Flaubert, Daudet, Zola. I am not quite sure whether he named both Daudet and Zola, but he certainly named one of the two. All were men of advanced opinions. The subject of the play was this, a woman had separated from her husband. She had loved again, and now lived with another man. This man was represented in the play as an excellent person. For years they had been quite happy. Her two children, a girl and a boy, were babies at the time of the separation. Now they had grown, and throughout all these years they had supposed the man to be their real father. The girl was about eighteen and the boy about seventeen. The man treated them quite as a father, they loved him, and he loved them. The scene represented the family meeting at breakfast. The girl comes in and approaches her supposed father, and he is going to kiss her, when the boy, who has learned in some way the true state of affairs, rushes forward and shouts, Don't dare. Noses pa. This exclamation brought down the house. There was an outburst of frantic applause. Flaubert and the others joined in it. I was disgusted. Why, I said, this family was happy. The man was a better father to these children than their real father, their mother loved him and was happy with him, this mischievous, perverted boy ought simply to be whipped for what he has said, it was of no use. I discussed for hours with them afterwards, none of them could understand me. I was, of course, fully in accordance with Turgenev's point of view. I remarked, however, that his acquaintances were chiefly amongst the middle classes. There, the difference between nation and nation is immense indeed. But my acquaintances were exclusively amongst the workers, and there is an immense resemblance between the workers, and especially amongst the peasants, of all nations. In so saying, I was quite wrong, however. After I had had the opportunity of making a closer acquaintance with French workers, I often thought of the truth of Turgenev's remark. There is a real chasm indeed between Russian conceptions of marriage relations and those which prevail in France, amongst the workers as well as in the middle classes. And in many other things there is a similar difference between the Russian point of view and that of other nations. It was said somewhere, after Turgenev's death, that he had intended to write a novel upon this subject. If he had begun it, the above-mentioned scene must be in his manuscript. What a pity that he did not write it. He, a thorough, occidental, in his ways of thinking, could have said very deep things upon a subject which must have so profoundly affected him personally throughout his life. Of all novel writers of our century, Turgenev has certainly attained the greatest perfection as an artist, and his prose sounds to the Russian ear like music, music as deep as that of Beethoven. His principal novels, the series of Dmitri Rudin, A Nobleman's Retreat, On the Eve, Fathers and Sons, Smoke, and virgin soil, represent the leading, history-making, types of the educated classes of Russia. Which evolved in rapid succession after 1848. All sketched with a fullness of philosophical conception and humanitarian understanding and an artistic beauty which have no parallel in any other literature. Yet, Fathers and Sons, a novel which he rightly considered his profoundest work, was received by the young people of Russia with a loud protest. Our youth declared that the nihilist Bazarov was by no means a true representation of his class. Many described him even as a caricature of nihilism. This misunderstanding deeply affected Turgenev, and, although a reconciliation between him and the young generation took place later on at St. 
Petersburg, after he had written, Virgin Soil, the wound inflicted upon him by these attacks was never healed. He knew from Lavrov that I was an enthusiastic admirer of his writings. And one day, as we were returning in a carriage from a visit to Antikolsky's studio, he asked me what I thought of Bazarov. I frankly replied, Bazarov is an admirable painting of the nihilist, but one feels that you did not love him as much as you did your other heroes. On the contrary, I loved him, intensely loved him, Turgenev replied, with an unexpected vigor. When we get home I will show you my diary, in which I have noted how I wept when I had ended the novel with Bazarov's death. Turgenev certainly loved the intellectual aspect of Bazarov. He so identified himself with the nihilist philosophy of his hero that he even kept a diary in his name, appreciating the current events from Bazarov's point of view. But I think that he admired him more than he loved him. In a brilliant lecture on Hamlet and Don Quixote, he divided the history makers of mankind into two classes, represented by one or the other of these characters. Analysis first of all, and then egotism, and therefore no faith, an egotist cannot even believe in himself, so he characterized Hamlet. Therefore he is a skeptic, and never will achieve anything. While Don Quixote, who fights against windmills, and takes a barber's plate for the magic helmet of Mambrino, who of us has never made the same mistake? Is a leader of the masses, because the masses always follow those who, taking no heed of the sarcasms of the majority, or even of persecutions, march straight forward, keeping their eyes fixed upon a goal which is seen, perhaps, by no one but themselves. They search, they fall, but they rise again, and find it, and by right, too. Yet, although Hamlet is a skeptic and disbelieves in good, he does not disbelieve in evil. He hates it, evil and deceit are his enemies. And his skepticism is not indifferentism, but only negation and doubt, which finally consume his will. These thoughts of Turgenev give, I think, the true key for understanding his relations to his heroes. He himself and several of his best friends belonged more or less to the Hamlets. He loved Hamlet and admired Don Quixote. So he admired also Bazarov. He represented his superiority admirably well, he understood the tragic character of his isolated position, but he could not surround him with that tender, poetical love which he bestowed as on a sick friend. When his heroes approached the Hamlet type, it would have been out of place. Did you know Mishkin? he once asked me, in 1878. At the trial of our circles Mishkin revealed himself as the most powerful personality. I should like to know all about him, he continued. That is a man. Not the slightest trace of Hamletism. And in so saying he was obviously meditating on this new type in the Russian movement, which did not exist in the phase that Turgenev described in Virgin Soil, but was to appear two years later. I saw him for the last time in the autumn of 1881. He was very ill, and worried by the thought that it was his duty to write to Alexander III, who had just come to the throne, and hesitated as to the policy he should follow, asking him to give Russia a constitution, and proving to him by solid arguments the necessity of that step. With evident grief he said to me, I feel that I must do it, but I feel that I shall not be able to do it. In fact, he was already suffering awful pains occasioned by a cancer in the spinal cord, and had the greatest difficulty even in sitting up and talking for a few moments. He did not write then, and a few weeks later it would have been useless. Alexander III had announced in a manifesto his intention to remain the absolute ruler of Russia. 7. I in the meantime affairs in Russia took quite a new turn. The war which Russia began against Turkey in 1877 had ended in general disappointment. There was in the country, before the war broke out, a great deal of enthusiasm in favor of the Slavonians. Many believed, also, that a war of liberation in the Balkans would result in a move in the progressive direction in Russia itself. But the liberation of the Slavonian populations was only partly accomplished. The tremendous sacrifices which had been made by the Russians were rendered ineffectual by the blunders of the higher military authorities. Hundreds of thousands of men had been slaughtered in battles which were only half victories, and the concessions wrested from Turkey were brought to naught at the Berlin Congress. 
It was also widely known that the embezzlement of state money went on during this war on almost as large a scale as during the Crimean War. It was amidst the general dissatisfaction which prevailed in Russia at the end of 1877 that 193 persons, arrested since 1873, in connection with our agitation, were brought before a high court. The accused, supported by a number of lawyers of talent, won at once the sympathies of the great public. They produced a very favorable impression upon St. Petersburg society. And when it became known that most of them had spent three or four years in prison, waiting for this trial, and that no less than twenty-one of them had either put an end to their lives by suicide or become insane. The feeling grew still stronger in their favor, even among the judges themselves. The court pronounced very heavy sentences upon a few, and relatively lenient ones upon the remainder, saying that the preliminary detention had lasted so long, and was so hard a punishment in itself, that nothing could justly be added to it. It was confidently expected that the emperor would still further mitigate the sentences. It happened, however, to the astonishment of all, that he revised the sentences only to increase them. Those whom the court had acquitted were sent into exile in remote parts of Russia and Siberia, and from five to twelve years of hard labor were inflicted upon those whom the court had condemned to short terms of imprisonment. This was the work of the chief of the third section, General Mezentsov. At the same time, the chief of this T. Petersburg police, General Trepov, noticing, during a visit to the house of detention, that one of the political prisoners, Boglobov, did not take off his hat to greet the omnipotent satrap, rushed upon him, gave him a blow, and, when the prisoner resisted, ordered him to be flogged. The other prisoners, learning the fact in their cells, loudly expressed their indignation, and were in consequence fearfully beaten by the warders and the police. The Russian political prisoners bore without murmuring all hardships inflicted upon them in Siberia or through hard labor, but they were firmly decided not to tolerate corporal punishment. A young girl, Vera Zasulik, who did not even personally know Boglobov, took a revolver, went to the chief of police, and shot at him. Trepov was only wounded. Alexander II came to look at the heroic girl, who must have impressed him by her extremely sweet face and her modesty. Trepov had so many enemies at St. Petersburg that they managed to bring the affair before a common law jury. And Vera Zasulik declared in court that she had resorted to arms only when all means for bringing the affair to public knowledge and obtaining some sort of redress had been exhausted. Even the St. Petersburg correspondent of the London Times had been asked to mention the affair in his paper, but had not done so, perhaps thinking it improbable. Then, without telling anyone her intentions, she went to shoot Trepov. Now that the affair had become public, she was quite happy to know that he was but slightly wounded. The jury acquitted her unanimously, and when the police tried to rearrest her, as she was leaving the courthouse, the young men of St. Petersburg, who stood in crowds at the gates, saved her from their clutches. She went abroad and soon was among us in Switzerland. This affair produced quite a sensation throughout Europe. I was at Paris when the news of the acquittal came, and had to call that day on business at the offices of several newspapers. I found the editors fired with enthusiasm, and writing powerful articles to glorify the girl. Even the serious Revue de Du Mons wrote, in its review of the year, that the two persons who had most impressed public opinion in Europe during 1878 were Prince Gorchikov at the Berlin Congress and Vera Zasulik. Their portraits were given side by side in several almanacs. Upon the workers in Europe the devotion of Vera Zasulik produced a tremendous impression. A few months after that, without any plot having been formed, for attempts were made against crowned heads in close succession. The worker Hodel and Dr. Nobiling shot at the German emperor. A few weeks later, a Spanish worker, Oliva Monquesai, followed with an attempt to shoot the king of Spain, and the cook Passanante rushed with his knife upon the king of Italy. The governments of Europe could not believe that such attempts upon the lives of three kings should have occurred without there being at the bottom some international conspiracy. And they jumped to the conclusion that the Jura Federation and the International Workingmen's Association were responsible. More than twenty years have passed since then, 
and I may say most positively that there was absolutely no ground whatever for that supposition. However, all the European governments fell upon Switzerland, reproaching her with harboring revolutionists, who organized such plots. Paul Bruce, the editor of our Jura newspaper, the Avant-Garde, was arrested and prosecuted. The Swiss judges, seeing there was not the slightest foundation for connecting Bruce or the Jura Federation with the recent attacks, condemned Bruce to only a couple of months' imprisonment, for his articles. But the paper was suppressed, and all the printing offices of Switzerland were asked by the federal government not to publish this or any similar paper. The Jura Federation thus remained without an organ. Besides, the politicians of Switzerland, who looked with an unfavorable eye on the anarchist agitation in their country, acted privately in such a way as to compel the leading Swiss members of the Jura Federation either to retire from public life or to starve. Bruce was expelled from Switzerland. James Guillaume, who for eight years had maintained against all obstacles the official organ of the Federation, and made his living chiefly by teaching, could obtain no employment, and was compelled to leave Switzerland and remove to France. Adhemer Schwitzgebel found no work in the watch trade, and, burdened as he was by a large family, had to retire from the movement. Spitziger was in the same condition, and emigrated. It thus happened that I, a foreigner, had to undertake the editing of the organ of the Federation. I hesitated, of course, but there was nothing else to be done, and with two friends, de Marthere and Hersig, I started a new fortnightly paper at Geneva, in February, 1879, under the title of Le Revolt. I had to write most of it myself. We had only twenty-three francs, about four dollars, to start the paper, but we all set to work to get subscriptions, and succeeded in issuing our first number. It was moderate in tone, but revolutionary in substance, and I did my best to write it in such a style that complex historical and economical questions should be comprehensible to every intelligent worker. 600 was the utmost limit which the edition of our previous papers had ever attained. We printed 2,000 copies of Le Revolt, and in a few days not one was left. The paper was a success, and still continues, at Paris, under the name of Temps Nouveau. Socialist papers have often a tendency to become mere annals of complaints about existing conditions. The oppression of the laborers in the mine, the factory, and the field is related, the misery and sufferings of the workers during strikes are told in vivid pictures. Their helplessness in the struggle against employers is insisted upon, and this succession of hopeless efforts, related in the paper, exercises a most depressing influence upon the reader. To counterbalance that effect, the editor has to rely chiefly upon burning words by means of which he tries to inspire his readers with energy and faith. I thought, on the contrary, that a revolutionary paper must be, above all, a record of those symptoms which everywhere announce the coming of a new era, the germination of new forms of social life, the growing revolt against antiquated institutions. These symptoms should be watched, brought together in their intimate connection, and so grouped as to show to the hesitating minds of the greater number the invisible and often unconscious support which advanced ideas find everywhere. When a revival of thought takes place in society, to make one feel sympathy with the throbbing of the human heart all over the world, with its revolt against age-long injustice, with its attempts at working out new forms of life, this should be the chief duty of a revolutionary paper. It is hope, not despair, which makes successful revolutions. Historians often tell us how this or that system of philosophy has accomplished a certain change in human thought, and subsequently in institutions. But this is not history. The greatest social philosophers have only caught the indications of coming changes, have understood their inner relations, and, aided by induction and intuition, have foretold what was to occur. It may also be easy to draw a plan of social organization, by starting from a few principles and developing them to their necessary consequences, like a geometrical conclusion from a few axioms, but this is not sociology. A correct social forecast cannot be made unless one keeps an eye on the thousands of signs of the new life, separating the occasional facts from those which are organically essential, and building the generalization upon that basis. This was the method of thought with which I endeavored to familiarize my readers, 
using plain comprehensible words, so as to accustom the most modest of them to judge for himself whereunto society is moving, and himself to correct the thinker if the latter comes to wrong conclusions. As to the criticism of what exists, I went into it only to disentangle the roots of the evils, and to show that a deep-seated and carefully nurtured fetishism with regard to the antiquated survivals of past phases of human development, and a widespread cowardice of mind and will, are the main sources of all evils. De Martheray and Hersig gave me full support in that direction. De Martheray was born in one of the poorest peasant families in Savoy. His schooling had not gone beyond the first rudiments of a primary school. Yet he was one of the most intelligent men I ever met. His appreciations of current events and men were so remarkable for their uncommon good sense that they were often prophetic. He was also one of the finest critics of the current socialist literature, and was never taken in by the mere display of fine words or would-be science. Persig was a young clerk, born at Geneva. A man of suppressed emotions, shy, who would blush like a girl when he expressed an original thought, and who, after I was arrested, when he became responsible for the continuance of the journal, by sheer force of will learn to write very well. Boycotted by all Geneva employers, and fallen with his family into sheer misery, he nevertheless supported the paper till it became possible to transfer it to Paris. To the judgment of these two friends I could trust implicitly. If Hersig frowned, muttering, yes, well, it may go, I knew that it would not do. And when de Martherary, who always complained of the bad state of his spectacles when he had to read a not quite legibly written manuscript, and therefore generally read proofs only, interrupted his reading by exclaiming, Non, Siani va pa. I felt at once that it was not the proper thing, and tried to guess what thought or expression provoked his disapproval. I knew there was no use asking him, Why will it not do? He would have answered, Ah, that is not my affair, that's yours. It won't do, that is all I can say. But I felt he was right, and I simply sat down to rewrite the passage, or, taking the composing stick, set up in type a new passage instead. I must own also that we had hard times with it. No sooner had we issued four or five numbers than the printer asked us to find another printing office. For the workers and their publications the liberty of the press inscribed in the Constitution has many limitations beside the paragraphs of the law. The printer had no objection to our paper, he liked it. But in Switzerland all printing offices depend upon the government, which employs them more or less upon statistical reports and the like. And our printer was plainly told that if he continued to print the paper he need not expect to have any more orders from the Geneva government. I made the tour of all the French-speaking part of Switzerland, and saw the heads of all the printing offices, but everywhere, even from those who did not dislike the tendency of our paper. I received the same reply, we could not live without work from the government, and we should have none if we undertook to print Le Revolt. I returned to Geneva in very low spirits, but de Martheray was only the more ardent and hopeful. It's all very simple, he said. We buy our own printing plant on a three months credit, and in three months we shall have paid for it. But we have no money, only a few hundred francs, I objected. Money, nonsense. We shall have it. Let us only order the type at once and immediately issue our next number, and money will come. Once more his judgment was quite right. When our next number came out from our own imprimery jurisienne, and we had told our difficulties and printed a couple of small pamphlets besides, all of us helping in the printing, the money came in. Mostly in coppers and small silver coins, but it came. Over and over again in my life I have heard complaints among the advanced parties about the want of money. But the longer I live, the more I am persuaded that our chief difficulty is not so much a lack of money as of men who will march firmly and steadily towards a given aim in the right direction, and inspire others. For twenty-one years our paper has now continued to live from hand to mouth, appeals for funds appearing on the front page in almost every number. But as long as there is a man who sticks to it and puts all his energy into it, as Hersig and de Martheray did at Geneva, and as Grave has done for the last sixteen years at Paris, the money comes in. 
and a yearly debit of about £800 is made up, mainly out of the pennies and small silver coins of the workers, to cover the yearly expenditure for printing the paper and the pamphlets. For a paper, as for everything else, men are of an infinitely greater value than money. We started our printing office in a tiny room, and our compositor was a man from Little Russia, who undertook to put our paper in type for the very modest sum of 60 francs a month. If he could only have his modest dinner every day, and the possibility of going occasionally to the opera, he cared for nothing more. Going to the Turkish bath, John. I asked him once as I met him at Geneva in the street, with a brown paper parcel under his arm. No, removing to a new lodging, he replied, in his usual melodious voice, and with his customary smile. Unfortunately, he knew no French. I used to write my manuscript in the best of my handwriting, often thinking with regret of the time I had wasted in the classes of our good Ebert at school, but John could read French only indifferently well. And instead of immediatement, he would read immediatement or immediatement, and set up in type such wonderful words as these. But as he kept the space, and the length of the line did not have to be altered in making the corrections, there were only four or five letters to be corrected in such uncouth words as the above, and but one or two in each of the shorter ones. Thus we managed pretty well. We were on the best possible terms with him, and I soon learned a little typesetting under his direction. The composition was always finished in time to take the proofs to a Swiss comrade who was the responsible editor, and to whom we submitted them before going to press, and then one of us carted all the forms to a printing office. Our imprimerie jurisienne soon became widely known for its publications, especially for its pamphlets, which de Martheray would never allow to be sold at more than one penny. Quite a new style had to be worked out for such pamphlets. I must say that I was often wicked enough to envy those writers who could use any number of pages for developing their ideas, and were allowed to make the well-known excuse of Talleyrand, I have not had the time to be brief. When I had to condense the results of several months' work, upon, let me say, the origins of law, into a penny pamphlet, I had to take the time to be brief. But we wrote for the workers, and twenty centimes for a pamphlet is often too much for the average worker. The result was that our penny and halfpenny pamphlets sold by the scores of thousands, and were reproduced in many other countries in translations. My leaders of that period were published later on, while I was in prison, by Ella Z. Reckless, under the title of, The Words of a Rebel, Paroles Done Revolt. France was always the chief object of our aims. But, Blue Revolt was severely prohibited in France, and the smugglers had so many good things to import into France from Switzerland that they did not care to meddle with our paper. I went once with them, crossing in their company the French frontier, and found that they were very brave and reliable men, but I could not induce them to undertake the smuggling of our paper. All we could do, therefore, was to send it in sealed envelopes to about a hundred persons in France. We charged nothing for postage, counting upon voluntary contributions from our subscribers to cover our extra expenses, which they always did. But we often thought that the French police were missing a splendid opportunity for ruining our paper by subscribing to a hundred copies and sending no voluntary contributions. For the first year we had to rely entirely upon ourselves, but gradually LZ Reckless took a greater interest in the work, and finally gave more life than ever to the paper after my arrest. Reckless had invited me to aid him in the preparation of the volume of his monumental geography which dealt with the Russian dominions in Asia. He had learned Russian, but thought that, as I was well acquainted with Siberia, I might be helpful. And as the health of my wife was poor, and the doctor had ordered her to leave Geneva with its cold winds at once, we removed early in the spring of 1880 to Clarence, where Elise Reckless lived at that time. We settled above Clarence, in a small cottage overlooking the blue waters of Lake Geneva, with the pure snow of the Dent du Midi in the background. A streamlet that thundered like a mighty torrent after rains, carrying away immense rocks and digging for itself a new bed, ran under our windows, and on the slope of the hill opposite rose the old castle of Chatelard, of which the owners. Up to the revolution of the Burla Pepe, the burners of the papers, in 1799, levied upon the neighboring peasants several taxes on the occasion of births, marriages, and deaths. 
Here, aided by my wife, with whom I used to discuss every event and every proposed paper, and who was a severe literary critic of my writings, I produced the best things that I wrote for Le Revolt, among them the address to the young, which was spread in hundreds of thousands of copies in all languages. In fact, I worked out here the foundation of nearly all that I wrote later on. Contact with educated men of similar ways of thinking is what we anarchist writers, scattered by prescription all over the world, miss, perhaps, more than anything else. At Clarens I had that contact with Elise Reckless and Lefren Kais, in addition to permanent contact with the workers, which I continued to maintain. And although I worked much for the geography, I could produce even more than usual for the anarchist propaganda. 8. In Russia the struggle for freedom was taking on a and more acute character. Several political trials had been brought before high courts, the trial of the 193, of the 50, of the Dalgashin Circle, and so on, and in all of them the same thing was apparent. The youth had gone to the peasants and the factory workers, preaching socialism to them, socialist pamphlets, printed abroad, had been distributed. Appeals had been made to revolt, in some vague, indeterminate way, against the oppressive economical conditions. In short, nothing was done that does not occur in socialist agitations in every other country of the world. No traces of conspiracy against the Tsar, or even of preparations for revolutionary action, were found, in fact, there were none. The great majority of our youth were at that time hostile to such action. Nay, looking now over that movement of the years 1870-78, I can say in full confidence that most of them would have felt satisfied if they bad been simply allowed to live by the side of the peasants and the workers, to teach them. To collaborate in any of the thousand capacities, private or as a part of the local self-government, in which an educated and earnest man or woman can be useful to the masses of the people. I knew the men, and say so with full knowledge of them. Yet the sentences were ferocious, stupidly ferocious, because the movement, which bad grown out of the previous state of Russia, was too deeply rooted to be crushed down by mere brutality. Hard labor for six, ten, twelve years in the mines, with subsequent exile to Siberia for life, was a common sentence. There were such cases as that of a girl who got nine years hard labor and life exile to Siberia, for giving one socialist pamphlet to a worker, that was all her crime. Another girl of fourteen, Miss Gukovskaya, was transported for life to a remote village of Siberia, for having tried, like Gerda's Klerchen, to excite an indifferent crowd to deliver Kowalski and his friends when they were going to be hanged. An act the more natural in Russia, even from the authorities' standpoint, as there is no capital punishment in our country for common law crimes, and the application of the death penalty to politicals was then a novelty. A return to almost forgotten traditions. Thrown into the wilderness, this young girl soon drowned herself in the Yenisei. Even those who were acquitted by the courts were banished by the gendarmes to little hamlets in Siberia and northeast Russia, where they had to starve on the government's monthly allowance, one dollar and fifty cents, three rubles. There are no industries in such hamlets, and the exiles were strictly prohibited from teaching. As if to exasperate the youth still more, their condemned friends were not sent direct to Siberia. They were locked up, first, for a number of years, in central prisons, which made them envy the convicts' life in Siberia. These prisons were awful indeed. In one of them, a den of typhoid fever, as a priest of that particular jail said in a sermon, the mortality reached 20% in 12 months. In the central prisons, in the hard labor prisons of Siberia, in the fortress, the prisoners had to resort to the strike of death, the famine strike, to protect themselves from the brutality of the warders. Or to obtain conditions, some sort of work, or reading, in their cells, that would save them from being driven into insanity in a few months. The horror of such strikes, during which men and women refused to take any food for seven or eight days in succession, and then lay motionless, their minds wandering, seemed not to appeal to the gendarmes. At Kharkov, the prostrated prisoners were tied up with ropes and fed by force artificially. Information of these horrors leaked out from the prisons, crossed the boundless distances of Siberia, and spread far and wide among the youth. 
There was a time when not a week passed without disclosing some new infamy of that sort, or even worse. Sheer exasperation took hold of our young people. In other countries, they began to say, men have the courage to resist. An Englishman, a Frenchman, would not tolerate such outrages. How can we tolerate them? Let us resist, arms in hands, the nocturnal raids of the gendarmes. Let them know, at least, that since arrest means a slow and infamous death at their hands, they will have to take us in a mortal struggle. At Odessa, Kowalski and his friends met with revolver shots the gendarmes who came one night to arrest them. The reply of Alexander II. To this new move was the proclamation of a state of siege. Russia was divided into a number of districts, each of them under a governor-general, who received the order to hang offenders pitilessly. Kowalski and his friends, who, by the way, had killed no one by their shots, were executed. Hanging became the order of the day. Twenty-three persons perished in two years, including a boy of nineteen, who was caught posting a revolutionary proclamation at a railway station, this act I say it deliberately, was the only charge against him. He was a boy, but he died like a man. Then the watchword of the revolutionists became, self-defense, self-defense against the spies who introduced themselves into the circles under the mask of friendship, and denounced members right and left. Simply because they would not be paid if they did not accuse large numbers of persons. Self-defense against those who ill-treated prisoners, self-defense against the omnipotent chiefs of the state police. Three functionaries of Mark and two or three small spies fell in that new phase of the struggle. General Mezentsov, who had induced the Tsar to double the sentences after the trial of the 193, was killed in broad daylight at St. Petersburg. A gendarme colonel, guilty of something worse than that, had the same fate at Kiev, and the governor-general of Kharkov, my cousin, Dmitry Kropotkin, was shot as he was returning home from a theater. The central prison, in which the first famine strike and artificial feeding took place, was under his orders. In reality he was not a bad man, I know that his personal feelings were somewhat favorable to the political prisoners. But he was a weak man and a courtier, and he hesitated to interfere. One word from him would have stopped the ill-treatment of the prisoners. Alexander II. Liked him so much, and his position at the court was so strong, that his interference very probably would have been approved. Thank you. You have acted according to my own wishes, the Tsar said to him, a couple of years before that date, when B came to St. Petersburg to report that he had taken a peaceful attitude in a riot of the poorer population of Kharkov, and had treated the rioters very leniently. But this time he gave his approval to the jailers, and the young men of Kharkov were so exasperated at the treatment of their friends that one of them shot him. However, the personality of the emperor was kept out of the struggle, and down to the year 1879 no attempt was made on his life. The person of the liberator of the serfs was surrounded by an aureole which protected him infinitely better than the swarms of police officials. If Alexander II had shown at this juncture the least desire to improve the state of affairs in Russia if he had only called in one or two of those men with whom he had collaborated during the reform period, and had ordered them to make an inquiry into the conditions of the country, or merely of the peasantry. If he had shown any intention of limiting the powers of the secret police, his steps would have been hailed with enthusiasm. A word would have made him, the liberator, again, and once more the youth would have repeated Herzen's words, Thou hast conquered, Galilean. But just as during the Polish insurrection the despot awoke in him, and, inspired by Katkoff, he resorted to hanging, so now again, following the advice of his evil genius, Katkoff. He found nothing to do but to nominate special military governors, for hanging. Then, and then only, a handful of revolutionists, the executive committee, supported, I must say, by the growing discontent in the educated classes, and even in the Tsar's immediate surroundings, declared that war against absolutism which, after several attempts, ended in 1881 in the death of Alexander II. Two men, I have said already, lived in Alexander II, and now the conflict between the two, which had grown during all his life, assumed a really tragic aspect. When he met Solovyov, 
who shot at him and missed the first shot, he had the presence of mind to run to the nearest door, not in a straight line, but in zigzags, while Solovyov continued to fire. And be thus escaped with but a slight tearing of his overcoat. On the day of his death, too, he gave a proof of his undoubted courage. In the face of real danger he was courageous. But he continually trembled before the phantasms of his own imagination. Once he shot at an aide de cas when the latter had made an abrupt movement, and Alexander thought he was going to attempt his life. Merely to save his life, he surrendered entirely all his imperial powers into the hands of those who cared nothing for him, but only for their lucrative positions. He undoubtedly retained an attachment to the mother of his children, even though he was then with the Princess Yurievsky Dolgoruki, whom he married immediately after the death of the Empress. Don't speak to me of the Empress. It makes me suffer too much, he more than once said to Loris Melikov. And yet he entirely abandoned the Empress Marie, who had stood faithfully by his side while he was the liberator, he let her die in the palace in neglect. A well-known Russian doctor, now dead, told his friends that he, a stranger, felt shocked at the neglect with which the Empress was treated during her last illness, deserted, of course, by the ladies of the court. Having by her side but two ladies, deeply devoted to her, and receiving every day but a short official visit from her husband, who stayed in another palace in the meantime. When the executive committee made the daring attempt to blow up the Winter Palace itself, Alexander II took a step which had no precedent. He created a sort of dictatorship, vesting unlimited powers in Loris Melikov. This general was an Armenian, to whom Alexander II had once before given similar dictatorial powers, when the bubonic plague broke out on the lower Volga, and Germany threatened to mobilize her troops and put Russia under quarantine if the plague were not stopped. Now that Alexander II saw that he could not have confidence in the vigilance of even the palace police, he gave dictatorial powers to Loris Melikov, and as Melikov had the reputation of being a liberal. This new move was interpreted as indicating that the convocation of a national assembly would soon follow. As, however, no new attempts upon his life were made immediately after that explosion, the Tsar regained confidence, and a few months later, before Melikov had been allowed to do anything, he was dictator no longer. But simply Minister of the Interior. The sudden attacks of sadness of which I have already spoken, during which Alexander II reproached himself with the reactionary character that his reign had assumed, now took the shape of violent paroxysms of tears. He would sit weeping by the hour, bringing Melikov to despair. Then he would ask his minister, when will your constitutional scheme be ready? If, two days later, Melikov said that it was now ready, the emperor seemed to have forgotten all about it. Did I mention it? he would ask. What for? We had better leave it to my successor. That will be his gift to Russia. When rumors of a new plot reached him, he was ready to undertake something, but when everything seemed to be quiet among the revolutionists, he turned his ear again to his reactionary advisers, and let things go. Every moment Melikov expected dismissal. In February, 1881, Melikov reported that a new plot bad been laid by the executive committee, but its plan could not be discovered by any amount of searching. Thereupon Alexander II decided that a sort of deliberative assembly of delegates from the provinces should be called. Always under the idea that B would share the fate of Louis XVI. He described this gathering as an assembly de notables, like the one convoked by Louis XVI. Before the National Assembly in 1789. The scheme had to be laid before the Council of State, but then again he hesitated. It was only on the morning of March 1, 13, 1881, after a final warning by Loris Melikov, that he ordered it to be brought before the council on the following Thursday. This was on Sunday, and he was asked by Melikov not to go out to the parade that day, there being danger of an attempt on his life. Nevertheless, he went. He wanted to see the Grand Duchess Catherine, daughter of his aunt, Helene Pavlovna, who had been one of the leaders of the Emancipation Party in 1861, and to carry her the welcome news. Perhaps as an expiatory offering to the memory of the Empress Marie. He is said to have told her, 
J.E. Me Sui decide a convoker on Assembly de Notables. However, this belated and half-hearted concession had not been announced, and on his way back to the Winter Palace he was killed. It is known how it happened. A bomb was thrown under his ironclad carriage, to stop it. Several Circassians of the escort were wounded. Risikov, who flung the bomb was arrested on the spot. Then, although the coachman of the Tsar earnestly advised him not to get out, saying that he could drive him still in the slightly damaged carriage, he insisted upon alighting. He felt that his military dignity required him to see the wounded Circassians, to condole with them as he had done with the wounded during the Turkish war, when a mad storming of Plevna, doomed to end in a terrible disaster, was made on the day of his fate. He approached Risikov and asked him something, and as he passed close by another young man, Grinovetsky, the latter threw a bomb between himself and Alexander II, so that both of them should be killed. They both lived but a few hours. There Alexander II lay upon the snow, profusely bleeding, abandoned by every one of his followers. All had disappeared. It was cadets, returning from the parade, who lifted the suffering Tsar from the snow and put him in a sledge, covering his shivering body with a cadet mantle and his bare head with a cadet cap. And it was one of the terrorists, Emelianov, with a bomb wrapped in a paper under his arm, who, at the risk of being arrested on the spot and hanged, rushed with the cadets to the help of the wounded man. Human nature is full of these contrasts. Thus ended the tragedy of Alexander II's life. People could not understand how it was possible that a Tsar who bad done so much for Russia should have met his death at the hands of revolutionists. To me, who had the chance of witnessing the first reactionary steps of Alexander II and his gradual deterioration, who had caught a glimpse of his complex personality, that of a born autocrat, whose violence was but partially mitigated by education, of a man possessed of military gallantry. But devoid of the courage of the statesman, of a man of strong passions and weak will, it seemed that the tragedy developed with the unavoidable fatality of one of Shakespeare's dramas. Its last act was already written for me on the day when I heard him address us, the promoted officers, on June 13, 1862, immediately after he had ordered the first executions in Poland. 9. A wild panic seized the court circles at St. Petersburg. Alexander III. Who, notwithstanding his colossal stature and force, was not a very courageous man, refused to move to the Winter Palace, and retired to the palace of his grandfather, Paul I, at Kachina. I know that old building, planned as a Vauban fortress, surrounded by moats and protected by watchtowers, from the tops of which secret staircases lead to the emperor's study. I have seen the trap doors in the study, for suddenly throwing an enemy on the sharp rocks in the water underneath, and the secret staircase leading to underground prisons and to an underground passage which opens on a lake. All the palaces of Paul I had been built on a similar plan. In the meantime, an underground gallery, supplied with automatic electric appliances to protect it from being undermined by the revolutionists, was dug round the Anichkov Palace, in which Alexander III resided when he was heir apparent. A secret league for the protection of the Tsar was started. Officers of all grades were induced by triple salaries to join it, and to undertake voluntary spying in all classes of society. Comical scenes followed, of course. Two officers, without knowing that they both belonged to the League, would entice each other into a disloyal conversation, during a railway journey, and then proceed to arrest each other. Only to discover at the last moment that their pains had been labor lost. This League still exists in a more official shape, under the name of Okrana, protection, and from time to time frightens the present Tsar with all sorts of concocted dangers, in order to maintain its existence. A still more secret organization, the Holy League, was formed at the same time, under the leadership of the brother of the Tsar, Vladimir, for the purpose of opposing the revolutionists in different ways. One of which was to kill those of the refugees who were supposed to have been the leaders of the late conspiracies. I was of this number. The Grand Duke violently reproached the officers of the League for their cowardice, regretting that there were none among them who would undertake to kill such refugees. And an officer, 
who had been a page to chamber at the time I was in the Corps of Pages, was appointed by the League to carry out this particular work. The fact is that the refugees abroad did not interfere with the work of the Executive Committee at St. Petersburg. To pretend to direct conspiracies from Switzerland, while those who were at ST. Petersburg acted under a permanent menace of death, would have been sheer nonsense, and as Stepniak and I wrote several times, none of us would have accepted the doubtful task of forming plans of action without being on the spot. But of course it suited the plans of the St. Petersburg police to maintain that they were powerless to protect the Tsar because all plots were devised abroad, and their spies, I know it well, amply supplied them with the desired reports. Skoblev, the hero of the Turkish war, was also asked to join this league, but he blankly refused. It appears from Loris Melikov's posthumous papers, part of which were published by a friend of his in London, that when Alexander III came to the throne and hesitated to convoke the assembly of notables, Skoblev even made an offer to Loris Melikov and Count Ignatiev, the lying pasha, as the Constantinople diplomatists used to nickname him, to arrest Alexander III and compel him to sign a constitutional manifesto, whereupon Ignatiev is said to have denounced the scheme to the Tsar, and thus to have obtained his nomination as Prime Minister, in which capacity he resorted, with the advice of M. Andrius, the ex-prefect of police at Paris, to various stratagems in order to paralyze the revolutionists. If the Russian liberals had shown anything like a modest courage and some power of organized action, at that time, a national assembly would have been convoked. From the same posthumous papers of Loris Melikov it appears that Alexander III was willing for a time to call one. He had made up his mind to do so, and had announced it to his brother. Old Wilhelm I supported him in this intention. It was only when he saw that the liberals undertook nothing, while the Katkov party was busy in the opposite direction, M. Andreas advising him to crush the nihilists, and indicating how it ought to be done, his letter to this effect is in the pamphlet referred to, that Alexander III finally resolved to declare that he would continue to be absolute ruler of the empire. I was expelled from Switzerland by order of the Federal Council a few months after the death of Alexander II. I did not take umbrage at this. Assailed by the monarchical powers on account of the asylum which Switzerland offered to refugees, and menaced by the Russian official press with a wholesale expulsion of all Swiss governesses and ladies' maids, who are numerous in Russia. The rulers of Switzerland, by banishing me, gave some sort of satisfaction to the Russian police. But I very much regret, for the sake of Switzerland itself, that that step was taken. It was a sanction given to the theory of conspiracies concocted in Switzerland, and it was an acknowledgement of weakness, of which Italy and France took advantage at once. Two years later, when Jules Ferry proposed to Italy and Germany the partition of Switzerland, his argument must have been that the Swiss government itself had admitted that Switzerland was a hotbed of international conspiracies. This first concession led to more arrogant demands, and has certainly placed Switzerland in a far less independent position than it might otherwise have occupied. The decree of expulsion was delivered to me immediately after I had returned from London, where I was present at an anarchist congress in July, 1881. After that congress I had stayed for a few weeks in England, writing the first articles on Russian affairs from our standpoint for the Newcastle Chronicle. The English press, at that time, was an echo of the opinions of Madame Novikov, that is, of Katkov and the Russian state police, and I was most happy when Mr. Joseph Cowan agreed to give me the hospitality of his paper in order to state our point of view. I had just joined my wife in the high mountains where she was staying, near the abode of L. Z. Reckless, when I was asked to leave Switzerland. We sent the little luggage we had to the next railway station and went on foot to Egel, enjoying for the last time the sight of the mountains that we loved so much. We crossed the hills by taking short cuts over them, and laughed when we discovered that the short cuts led to long windings, and when we reached the bottom of the valley, we tramped along the dusty road. The comical incident which always comes in such cases was supplied by an English lady. A richly dressed dame, reclining by the side of a gentleman in a hired carriage, threw several tracks to the two poorly dressed tramps, as she passed them. I lifted the tracks from the dust. 
She was evidently one of those ladies who believe themselves to be Christians, and consider it their duty to distribute religious tracts among dissolute foreigners. Thinking we were sure to overtake the lady at the railway station, I wrote on one of the pamphlets the well-known verse relative to the rich in the kingdom of God. And similarly appropriate quotations about the Pharisees being the worst enemies of Christianity. When we came to Aigle, the lady was taking refreshments in her carriage. She evidently preferred to continue the journey in this vehicle along the lovely valley, rather than to be shut up in a stuffy railway car. I returned her the pamphlets with politeness, saying, that I had added to them something that she might find useful for her own instruction. The lady did not know whether to fly at me, or to accept the lesson with Christian patience. Her eyes expressed both impulses in rapid succession. My wife was about to pass her examination for the degree of Bachelor of Science at the Geneva University, and we settled, therefore, in a tiny town of France, though non, situated on the Savoy coast of the Lake of Geneva. And stayed there a couple of months. As to the death sentence of the Holy League, a warning reached me from one of the highest quarters of Russia. Even the name of the lady who was sent from St. Petersburg to Geneva to be the head center of the conspiracy became known to me. So I simply communicated the fact and the names to the Geneva correspondent of the Times, asking him to publish them if anything should happen, and I put a note to that effect in Le Revolt. After that I did not trouble myself more about it. My wife did not take it so lightly, and the good peasant woman, Madame Sanso, who gave us board and lodgings at Tho Nan, and who bad learned of the plot in a different way, through her sister, who was a nurse in the family of a Russian agent, bestowed the most touching care upon me. Her cottage was out of town, and whenever I went to town at night, sometimes to meet my wife at the railway station, she always found a pretext to have me accompanied by her husband with a lantern. Wait only a moment, Monsieur Kropotkin, she would say, my husband is going that way for purchases, and you know he always carries a lantern. Or else she would send her brother to follow me a distance, without my noticing it. X. In October or November, 1881, as soon as my wife passed her examination, we removed from Donan to London, where we stayed nearly twelve months. Few years separate us from that time, and yet I can say that the intellectual life of London and of all England was quite different then from what it became a little later. Every one knows that in the forties England stood almost at the head of the socialist movement in Europe. But during the years of reaction that followed, the great movement, which had deeply affected the working classes, and in which all that is now put forward as scientific or anarchist socialism had already been said, came to a standstill. It was forgotten, in England as well as on the continent, and what the French writers describe as, the third awakening of the proletarians, had not yet begun in Britain. The labors of the Agricultural Commission of 1871, the propaganda amongst the agricultural laborers, and the previous efforts of the Christian socialists had certainly done something to prepare the way. But the outburst of socialist feeling in England which followed the publication of Henry George's Progress and Poverty had not yet taken place. The year that I then passed in London was a year of real exile. For one who held advanced socialist opinions, there was no atmosphere to breathe in. There was no sign of that animated socialist movement which I found so largely developed on my return in 1886. Burns, Champion, Hardy, and the other labor leaders were not yet heard of, the Fabians did not exist, Morris had not declared himself a socialist, and the trade unions, limited in London to a few privileged trades only, were hostile to socialism. The only active and outspoken representatives of the socialist movement were Mr. and Mrs. Hindman, with a very few workers grouped round them. They had held in the autumn of 1881 a small congress, and we used to say jokingly but it was very nearly true that Mrs. Hindman had received all the congress in her house. Moreover, the more or less socialist radical movement which was certainly going on in the minds of men did not assert itself frankly and openly. That considerable number of educated men and women who appeared in public life four years later, and, without committing themselves to socialism, took part in various movements connected with the well-being or the education of the masses. And who have now created in almost every city of England and Scotland a quite new atmosphere of reform and a new society of reformers, had not then made themselves felt. 
They were there, of course, they thought and spoke, all the elements for a widespread movement were in existence, but, finding none of those centers of attraction which the socialist groups subsequently became, they were lost in the crowd. They did not know one another, or remained unconscious of their own selves. Tchaikovsky was then in London, and as in years past, we began a socialist propaganda amongst the workers. Aided by a few English workers whose acquaintance we had made at the Congress of 1881, or whom the prosecutions against John Most had attracted to the socialists, we went to the radical clubs, speaking about Russian affairs. The movement of our youth toward the people, and socialism in general. We had ridiculously small audiences, seldom consisting of more than a dozen men. Occasionally some grey-bearded chartist would rise from the audience and tell us that all we were saying had been said forty years before, and was greeted then with enthusiasm by crowds of workers, but that now all was dead. And there was no hope of reviving it. Mr. Hindman had just published his excellent exposition of Marxist socialism under the title of England for All, and I remember, one day in the summer of 1882, earnestly advising him to start a socialist paper. I told him what small means we had when we started Le Revolt, and predicted a certain success if he would make the attempt. But so unpromising was its general outlook that even he thought the undertaking would be absolutely hopeless unless he had the means to defray all its expenses. Perhaps he was right. But when, less than three years later, he started Justice, it found a hearty support among the workers, and early in 1886 there were three socialist papers, and the Social Democratic Federation was an influential's body. In the summer of 1882 I spoke, in broken English, before the Durham miners at their annual gathering. I delivered lectures at Newcastle, Glasgow, and Edinburgh about the Russian movement, and was received with enthusiasm, a crowd of workers giving hearty cheers for the nihilists, after the meeting, in the street. But my wife and I felt so lonely in London, and our efforts to awaken a socialist movement in England seemed so hopeless, that in the autumn of 1882 we decided to remove again to France. We were sure that in France I should soon be arrested. But we often said to each other, better a French prison than this grave. Those who are prone to speak of the slowness of evolution ought to study the development of socialism in England. Evolution is slow, but its rate is not uniform. It has its periods of slumber and its periods of sudden progress. 11. We settled once more in Donan, taking lodgings with our former hostess, Madame Sanso. A brother of my wife, who was dying of consumption, and had come to Switzerland, joined us. I never saw such numbers of Russian spies as during the two months that I remained at Donan. To begin with, as soon as we had engaged lodgings, a suspicious character, who gave himself out for an Englishman, took the other part of the house. Flocks, literally flocks of Russian spies besieged the house, seeking admission under all possible pretexts, or simply tramping in pairs, trios, and quartets in front of the house. I can imagine what wonderful reports they wrote. A spy must report. If he should merely say that he has stood for a week in the street without noticing anything mysterious, he would soon be put on the half-pay list or dismissed. It was then the golden age of the Russian secret police. Ignatiev's policy had borne fruit. There were two or three bodies of police competing with one another, each having any amount of money at their disposal, and carrying on the boldest intrigues. Colonel Sudikin, for instance, chief of one of the branches, plotting with a certain Degef, who after all killed him, denounced Ignatiev's agents to the revolutionists at Geneva. And offered to the terrorists in Russia all facilities for killing the Minister of the Interior, Count Tolstoy, and the Grand Duke Vladimir. Adding that he himself would then be nominated Minister of the Interior, with dictatorial powers, and the Tsar would be entirely in his hands. This activity of the Russian police culminated, later on, in the kidnapping of the Prince of Brandenburg from Bulgaria. The French police, also, were on the alert. The question, what is he doing at Donan, worried them. I continued to edit Dash, Le Revolt, and wrote articles for the Encyclopedia Britannica and the Newcastle Chronicle. But what reports could be made out of that? One day the local gendarme paid a visit to my landlady. 
He had heard from the street the rattling of some machine, and wished to report that I had in my house a secret printing press. So he came in my absence and asked the lady to show him the press. She replied that there was none and suggested that perhaps the gendarme had overheard the noise of her sewing machine. But he would not be convinced by so prosaic an explanation, and actually compelled the landlady to sew on her machine, while be listened inside the house and outside to make sure that the rattling he had heard was the same. What is he doing all day, he asked the landlady. He writes. He cannot write all day long. He saws wood in the garden at midday, and betakes walks every afternoon between four and five. It was in November. Ah, that's it. When the dusk is coming on. A la tombe de la nuit. And be wrote in his notebook, never goes out except at dusk. I could not well explain at that time this special attention of the Russian spies. But it must have had some connection with the following. When Ignatieff was nominated prime minister, advised by the ex-prefect of Paris, Andrius, be hit on a new plan. He sent a swarm of his agents into Switzerland, and one of them undertook the publication of a paper which slightly advocated the extension of provincial self-government in Russia, but whose chief purpose was to combat the revolutionists. And to rally to its standard those of the refugees who did not sympathize with terrorism. This was certainly a means of sowing division. Then, when nearly all the members of the executive committee had been arrested in Russia, and a couple of them had taken refuge at Paris, Ignatieff sent an agent to Paris to offer an armistice. He promised that there should be no further executions on account of the plots during the reign of Alexander II, even if those who bad escaped arrest fell into the hands of the government, that Chernyshevsky should be released from Siberia. And that a commission should be nominated to review the cases of all those who had been exiled to Siberia without trial. On the other side, he asked the executive committee to promise to make no attempts against the Tsar's life until his coronation was over. Perhaps the reforms in favor of the peasants, which Alexander III intended to make, were also mentioned. The agreement was made at Paris, and was kept on both sides. The terrorists suspended hostilities. Nobody was executed for complicity in the former conspiracies. Those who were arrested later on under this indictment were immured in the Russian Bastille at Schlüsselburg, where nothing was heard of them for fifteen years, and where most of them still are. Chernyshevsky was brought back from Siberia and ordered to stay at Astrakhan, where B was severed from all connection with the intellectual world of Russia, and soon died. A commission went through Siberia, releasing some of the exiles, and specifying terms of exile for the remainder. My brother Alexander received from it an additional five years. While I was at London, in 1882, I was told one day that a man who pretended to be a bona fide agent of the Russian government, and could prove it, wanted to enter into negotiations with me. Tell him that if he comes to my house I will throw him down the staircases, was my reply. Probably the result was that while Ignatiev considered the Tsar guaranteed from the attacks of the executive committee, he was afraid that the anarchists might make some attempt, and wanted to have me out of the way. 12. The anarchist movement had undergone a considerable development in France during the years 1881 and 1882. It was generally believed that the French mind was hostile to communism, and within the International Workingmen's Association, collectivism was preached instead. It meant then the possession of the instruments of production in common, each separate group having to settle for itself whether the consumption of produce should be on individualistic or communistic lines. In reality, however, the French mind was hostile only to the monastic communism, to the phalanstere of the old schools. When the Jura Federation, at its Congress of 1880, boldly declared itself anarchist-communist, that is, in favor of free communism anarchism won wide sympathy in France. Our paper began to spread in that, country, letters were exchanged in great numbers with French workers, and an anarchist movement of importance rapidly developed at Paris and in some of the provinces, especially in the Lyons region. When I crossed France in 1881, on my way from Donan to London, I visited Lyons, Saint-Étienne, and Vienne, lecturing there, and I found in these cities a considerable number of workers ready to accept our ideas. By the end of 1882 a terrible crisis prevailed in the Lyons region. 
the silk industry was paralyzed, and the misery among the weavers was so great that crowds of children stood every morning at the gates of the barracks, where the soldiers gave away what they could spare of their bread and soup. This was the beginning of the popularity of General Boulanger, who had permitted this distribution of food. The miners of the region were also very precarious state. I knew that there was a great deal of fermentation, but during the eleven months I had stayed at London I had lost close contact with the French movement. A few weeks after I returned to Donan I learned from the papers that the miners of Monsoles Mines, incensed at the vexations of the ultra-Catholic owners of the mines, had begun a sort of movement. They were holding secret meetings, talking of a general strike. The stone crosses erected on all the roads round the mines were thrown down or blown up by dynamite cartridges, which are largely used by the miners in underground work, and often remain in their possession. The agitation at Lyons also took on a more violent character. The anarchists, who were rather numerous in the city, allowed no meeting of the opportunist politicians to be held without obtaining a hearing for themselves, storming the platform, as a last resource. They brought forward resolutions to the effect that the mines and all necessaries for production, as well as the dwelling houses, ought to be owned by the nation. And these resolutions were carried with enthusiasm, to the horror of the middle classes. The feeling among the workers was growing every day against the opportunist town councillors and political leaders, as also against the press, which made light of a very acute crisis, while nothing was undertaken to relieve the widespread misery. As is usual at such times, the fury of the poorer people turned especially against the places of amusement and debauch, which become only the more conspicuous in times of desolation and misery. As they impersonate for the worker the egotism and dissoluteness of the wealthier classes. A place particularly hated by the workers was the underground café at the Theatre Belcour, which remained open all night, and where, in the small hours of the morning, one could see newspaper men and politicians feasting and drinking in company with gay women. Not a meeting was held but some menacing allusion was made to that café, and one night a dynamite cartridge was exploded in it by an unknown band. A worker who was occasionally there, a socialist, jumped to blow out the lighted fuse of the cartridge, and was killed, while a few of the feasting politicians were slightly wounded. Next day a dynamite cartridge was exploded at the doors of a recruiting bureau, and it was said that the anarchists intended to blow up the huge statue of the Virgin which stands on one of the hills of Lyons. One must have lived at Lyons or in its neighborhood to realize the extent to which the population and the schools are. Till in the hands of the Catholic clergy, and to understand the hatred that the male portion of the population feel toward the clergy. A panic now seized the wealthier classes of Lyons. Some sixty anarchists, all workers, and only one middle-class man, Emile Gautier, who was on a lecturing tour in the region, were arrested. The Lyons papers undertook at the same time to incite the government to arrest me, representing me as the leader of the agitation, who had come on purpose from England to direct the movement. Russian spies began to parade again in conspicuous numbers in our small town. Almost every day I received letters, evidently written by spies of the international police, mentioning some dynamite plot, or mysteriously announcing that consignments of dynamite bad been shipped to me. I made quite a collection of these letters, writing on each of them, Police Internationale, and they were taken away by the French police when they made a search in my house. But they did not dare to produce these letters in court, nor did they ever restore them to me. Not only was the house searched, but my wife, who was going to Geneva, was arrested at the station in Lonan, and searched. But of course absolutely nothing was found compromise me or anyone else. Ten days passed, during which I was quite free to away, if I wished to do so. I received several letters advising me to disappear, dash one of them from an unknown Russian friend, perhaps a member of the diplomatic staff, who seemed to have known me, and wrote that I must leave at once because otherwise I should be the first victim of the extradition treaty which was about to be concluded between France and Russia. I remained where I was, and when the Times inserted a telegram saying that I bad disappeared from Donan, I wrote a letter to the paper, giving my address. Since so many of my friends were arrested, I bad no intention of leaving. In the night of December 21 my brother-in-law died in my arms. 
We knew that his illness was incurable, but it is terrible to see a young life extinguished in your presence after a brave struggle against death. Both my wife and I were broken down. Three or four hours later, as the dull winter morning was dawning, gendarmes came to my house to arrest me. Seeing in what a state my wife was, I asked permission to remain with her till the burial was over, promising upon my word of honor to be at the prison door at a given hour, but it was refused, and the same night I was taken to Lyons. Elise Reckless, notified by telegraph, came at once, bestowing on my wife all the gentleness of his golden heart, friends came from Geneva. And although the funeral was absolutely civil, which was a novelty in that little town, half of the population was at the burial, to show my wife that the hearts of the poorer classes and the simple Savoy peasants were with us. And not with their rulers. When my trial was going on, the peasants used to come from the mountain villages to town to get the papers, and to see how my affair stood before the court. Another incident which profoundly touched me was the arrival at Lyons of an English friend. He came on behalf of a gentleman, well known and esteemed in the English political world, in whose family I had spent many happy hours at London, in 1882. He was the bearer of a considerable sum of money for the purpose of obtaining my release on bail, and he transmitted me at the same time the message of my London friend that I need not care in the least about the bail. But must leave France immediately. In some mysterious way he had managed to see me freely, not in the double-graded iron cage in which I was allowed interviews with my wife. And he was as much affected by my refusal to accept the offer as I was by that touching token of friendship on the part of one whom, with his excellent wife, I had already learned to esteem so highly. The French government wanted to have one of those great trials which produce an impression upon the population, but there was no possibility of prosecuting the arrested anarchists for the explosions. It would have required bringing us before a jury, which in all probability would have acquitted us. Consequently, the government adopted the Machiavellian course of prosecuting us for having belonged to the International Workingmen's Association. There is in France a law, passed immediately after the fall of the Commune, under which men can be brought b. for a simple police court for having belonged to that association. The maximum penalty is five years imprisonment. And a police court is always sure to pronounce the sentences which are wanted by the government. The trial began at Lyons in the first days of January, 1883, and lasted about a fortnight. The accusation was ridiculous, as everyone knew that none of the Lyons workers had ever joined the International, and it entirely fell through, as may be seen from the following episode. The only witness for the prosecution was the chief of the secret police at Lyons, an elderly man, who was treated at the court with the utmost respect. His report, I must say, was quite correct as concerns the facts. The anarchists, he said, bad taken hold of the population, they had rendered opportunist meetings impossible, because they spoke at each meeting, preaching communism and anarchism, and carrying with them the audiences. Seeing that so far he had been fair in his testimony, I ventured to ask him a question, Eleven did you ever hear the International Workingmen's Association spoken of at Lyons? Never, he replied sulkily. When I returned from the London Congress of 1881, and did all I could to have the International reconstituted in France, did I succeed? No. They did not find it revolutionary enough. Thank you, I said, and turning toward the procure added, there's all your prosecution overthrown by your own witness. Nevertheless, we were all condemned for having belonged to the International. Four of us got the maximum sentence, five years imprisonment and four hundred dollars fine, the remainder got from four years to one year. In fact, they never tried to prove anything concerning the International. It was quite forgotten. We were simply asked to speak about anarchism, and so we did. Not a word was said about the explosions. And when one or two of the Lyons comrades wanted to clear this point, they were bluntly told that they were not prosecuted for that but for having belonged to the International, to which I alone belonged. There is always some comical incident in such trials, and this time it was supplied by a letter of mine. There was nothing upon which to base the accusation. Scores of searches had been made at the houses of French anarchists, but only two letters of mine had been found. 
the prosecution tried to make the best of them. One was written to a French worker when he was despondent. I spoke to him in my letter about the great times we were living in, the great changes coming, the birth and spreading of new ideas, and so on. The letter was not long, and little capital was made out of it by the procure. As to the other letter, it was twelve pages long. I had written it to another French friend, a young shoemaker. He earned his living by making shoes in his own room. On his left side he used to have a small iron stove, upon which he himself cooked his daily meal, and upon his right a small stool upon which he wrote long letters to the comrades, without leaving his shoemaker's low bench. After he had made just as many pairs of shoes as were required to cover the expenses of his extremely modest living, and to send a few francs to his old mother in the country. He would spend long hours in writing letters in which he developed the theoretical principles of anarchism with admirable good sense and intelligence. He is now a writer well known in France and generally respected for the integrity of his character. Unfortunately, at that time he would cover eight or twelve pages of note paper without one single full stop, or even a comma. I once sat down and wrote a long letter in which I explained to him how our written thoughts subdivide into sentences, clauses, and phrases, each of which should end with its appropriate period, semicolon, or comma, and so on, in short. Gave him a little lesson in the elements of punctuation. I told him how much it would improve his writings if he adopted this simple plan. This letter was read by the prosecutor before the court and elicited from him most pathetic comments. You have heard, gentlemen, this letter, he went on, addressing the court. You have listened to it. There is nothing particular in it at first sight. He gives a lesson in grammar to a worker. But, and here his voice vibrated with accents of a deep emotion, it was not in order to help a poor worker in getting instruction which he, owing probably to laziness, failed to get at school. It was not to help him to earn an honest living. No. Gentlemen, it was written in order to inspire him with hatred for our grand and beautiful institutions, in order only the better to infuse into him the venom of anarchism, in order to make of him only a more terrible enemy of society. Cursed be the day when Kropotkin set his foot upon the soil of France. We could not help laughing like boys all the time B was, delivering that speech. The judges stared at him as if to tell him that B was overdoing his role, but be seemed not to notice anything, and, carried by his eloquence, went on speaking with more and more theatrical gestures and intonations. He really did his best to obtain his reward from the Russian government. Very soon after the condemnation the presiding magistrate was promoted to the magistracy of an assize court. As to the procure and another magistrate, one would hardly believe it, the Russian government offered them the Russian cross of Saint Anne, and they were allowed by the Republic to accept it. The famous Russian alliance, thus had its origin in the Lyons trial. This trial, during which most brilliant anarchist speeches, reported by all the papers, were made by such first-rate speakers as the worker Bernard and Emile Gautier, and during which all the accused took a very firm attitude. Preaching our doctrines for a fortnight had a powerful influence in clearing away false ideas about anarchism in France, and surely contributed to some extent to the revival of socialism in other countries. As to the condemnation, it was so little justified by the proceedings that the French press, with the exception of the papers devoted to the government, openly blamed the magistrates. Even the moderate journal The Economists found fault with the verdict, which nothing in the proceedings before the court could have made one foresee. The contest between the accusers and ourselves was won by us, in the public opinion. Immediately a proposition of amnesty was brought before the chamber, and received about a hundred votes in support of it. It came up regularly every year, each time securing more and more voices, until we were released. 13. The trial was over, but I remained for another couple of months in the Lyons prison. Most of my comrades had lodged an appeal against the decision of the police court, and we had to wait for its results. With four more comrades, I refused to take any part in that appeal to a higher court, and continued to work in my pistol. A great friend of mine Martin, a clothier from Vienne took another pistol by the side of the one which I occupied, and as we were already condemned, we were allowed to take our walks together. 
and when we had something to say to each other between the walks, we used to correspond by means of taps on the wall, just as in Russia. During my sojourn at Lyons I began to realize the awfully demoralizing influence of the prisons upon the prisoners, which brought me later to condemn unconditionally the whole institution. The Lyons prison is a modern structure, built in the shape of a star, on the cellular system. The spaces between the rays of the star are occupied by small asphalt paved yards, and, weather permitting, the inmates are taken to these yards to work outdoors. The chief occupation is the beating out of silk cocoons to obtain floss silk. Flocks of children are also taken at certain hours to these yards. Thin, enervated, underfed, the shadows of children, often watched them from my window. Anemia was plainly written on all the little faces and manifest in their thin, shivering bodies, and all day long not only in the dormitories, but even in the yards, in the full light of the sun they pursued their debilitating practices. What will become of them after they have passed through that schooling and come out with their health ruined, their wills annihilated, their energy reduced? Anemia, with its diminished energy, its unwillingness to work, its enfeebled will, weakened intellect, and perverted imagination, is responsible for crime to an infinitely greater extent than plethora. And it is precisely this enemy of the human race which is bred in prison. And then the teachings which these children receive in their surroundings. Mere isolation, even if it were rigorously carried out and it cannot be would be of little avail. The whole atmosphere of every prison is an atmosphere of glorification of that sort of gambling in clever strokes, which constitutes the very essence of theft, swindling, and all sorts of similar antisocial deeds. Whole generations of future criminals are bred in these nurseries, which the state supports and which society tolerates, simply because it does not want to hear its own diseases spoken of and dissected. Imprisoned in childhood, jailbird for life, is what I heard afterwards from all those who were interested in criminal matters. And when I saw these children, and realized what they have to expect in the future, I could not but continually ask myself. Which of them is the worst criminal, this child or the judge who condemns every year hundreds of children to this fate? I gladly admit that the crime of the judge is unconscious. But are all the crimes for which people are sent to prison as conscious as they are supposed to be? There was another point which I vividly realized from the very first weeks of my imprisonment, but which in some inconceivable way has escaped the attention of both the judges and the writers on criminal law. Namely, that imprisonment is in an immense number of cases a punishment which bears far more severely upon quite innocent people than upon the condemned prisoner himself. Nearly every one of my comrades, who represented a fair average of the working population, had either wife and children to support, or a sister or old mother who depended for her living upon his earnings. Now being left without support, all of these women did their best to get work, and some of them got it but none of them succeeded in earning regularly even as much as 30 cents, 1 fr 5 oc, a day. 9 francs, less than 2 dollars, and often only a dollar and a half a week to support themselves and their children, these were their earnings. And that meant, of course, undefeating, privations of all sorts, and deterioration of health, weakened intellect, impaired energy and willpower. I thus realized that what was going on in our law courts was in reality a condemnation of quite innocent people to all sorts of hardship, in most cases even worse than those to which the condemned man himself is subjected. The fiction is that the law punishes the man by inflicting upon him a variety of degrading physical and mental hardships. But man is so made that whatever hardships may be imposed upon him, he gradually grows accustomed to them. If he cannot modify them, he accepts them, and after a certain time he puts up with them, just as he puts up with a chronic disease, and grows insensible to them. But during his imprisonment what becomes of his wife and children, or of the other innocent people who depended upon his support? They are punished even more cruelly than he himself is. And, in our routine habits of thought, no one ever thinks of the immense injustice which is thus committed. I realized it only from actual experience. In the middle of March, 1883, twenty-two of us, who had been condemned to more than one year of imprisonment, were removed in great secrecy to the central prison of Clairvaux. It was formerly an abbey of Esti. 
Bernard, of which the Great Revolution had made a house for the poor. Subsequently it became a house of detention and correction, which went among the prisoners and the officials themselves under the well-deserved nickname of House of Detention and Corruption. So long as we were kept at Lyons we were treated as the prisoners under preliminary arrest are treated in France. That is, we had our own clothes, we could get our own food from a restaurant, and one could hire for a few francs per month a larger cell, a pistole. I took advantage of this for working hard upon my articles for the Encyclopedia Britannica and the 19th century. Now, the treatment we should have at Clairvaux was an open question. However, in France it is generally understood that, for political prisoners, the loss of liberty and the forced inactivity are in themselves so hard that there is no need to inflict additional hardships. Consequently, we were told that we should remain under the same regime that we had had at Lyons. We should have separate quarters, retain our own clothes, be free of compulsory work, and be allowed to smoke. Those of you, the governor said, who wish to earn something by manual work will be enabled to do so by sewing stays or engraving small things in mother of pearl. This work is poorly paid. But you could not be employed in the prison workshops for the fabrication of iron beds, picture frames, and so on, because that would require your lodging with the common law prisoners. Like the other prisoners, we were allowed to buy from the prison canteen some additional food and a pint of claret every day, both being supplied at a very low price and of good quality. The first impression which Clairvaux produced upon me was most favorable. We had been locked up and had been traveling all the day, from two or three o'clock in the morning, in those tiny cupboards into which the railway carriages used for the transportation of prisoners are usually divided. When we reached the central prison, we were taken temporarily to the penal quarters, and were introduced into extremely clean cells. Hot food, plain but excellent quality, had been served to us notwithstanding the late hour of the night, and we had been offered the opportunity of having a half pint each of the very good vin du pays. Which was sold at the prison canteen at the extremely modest price of twenty-four centimes, less than five cents, per quart. The governor and all the warders were most polite to us. Next day the governor of the prison took me to see the rooms which he intended to give us, and when I remarked that they were all right, only a little too small for such a number, we were twenty-two, and that overcrowding might result in illness. He gave us another set of rooms in what had been in olden times the house of the superintendent of the abbey, and was now the hospital our windows looked down upon a little garden and off upon beautiful views of the surrounding country. In another room, on the same landing, old Blanky had been kept the last three or four years before his release. Before that he was confined in one of the cells in the cellular house. We obtained thus three spacious rooms, and a smaller room was spared for Gautier and myself, so that we could pursue our literary work. We probably owed this last favor to the intervention of a considerable number of English men of science, who, as soon as I was condemned, had signed a petition asking for my release. Many contributors to the Encyclopedia Britannica, Herbert Spencer, and Swinburne were among the signers, while Victor Hugo had added to his signature a few warm words. Altogether, public opinion in France received our condemnation very unfavorably. And when my wife had mentioned at Paris that I required books, the Academy of Sciences offered its library, and Ernest Renat, in a charming letter, put his private library at her service. We had a small garden, where we could play ninepins or jeux de boules, and soon we managed to cultivate a narrow bed along the building's wall, in which, on a surface of some eighty square yards, we grew almost incredible quantities of lettuce and radishes, as well as some flowers. I need not say that at once we organized classes, and during the three years that we remained at Clairvaux I gave my comrades lessons in cosmography, geometry, or physics, also aiding them in the study of languages. Nearly every one learned at least one language English, German, Italian, or Spanish while a few learned two. We also managed to do some bookbinding having learned how from one of those excellent encyclopedia roared booklets. At the end of the first year, however, my health again gave way. Clairvaux is built on marshy ground, upon which malaria is endemic, and malaria, with scurvy, laid hold of me. Then my wife, who was studying at Paris, 
working in Wirtz's laboratory and preparing to take an examination for the degree of Doctor of Science, abandoned everything, and came to the tiny hamlet of Clairvaux. Which consists of less than a dozen houses grouped at the foot of an immense high wall which encircles the prison. Of course, her life in that hamlet, with the prison wall opposite, was anything but gay, yet she stayed there till I was released. During the first year she was allowed to see me only once in two months, and all interviews were held in the presence of a warder, who sat between us. But when she settled at Clairvaux, declaring her firm intention to remain there, she was soon permitted to see me every day, in one of the small houses within the prison walls where a post of warders was kept. And food was brought me from the inn where she stayed. Later, we were even allowed to take a walk in the governor's garden, closely watched all the time, and usually one of my comrades joined us in the walk. I was quite astonished to discover that the central prison of Clairvaux had all the aspects of a small manufacturing town, surrounded by orchards and cornfields, all encircled by an outer wall. The fact is, that if in a French central prison the inmates are perhaps more dependent upon the fancies and caprices of the governor and the warders than they seem to be in English prisons. The treatment of the prisoners is far more humane than it is in the corresponding institutions on the other side of the channel. The medieval revengeful system which still prevails in English prisons has been given up long since in France. The imprisoned man is not compelled to sleep on planks, or to have a mattress on alternate days only. The day he comes to prison he gets a decent bed, and retains it. He is not compelled, either, to degrading work, such as to climb a wheel, or to pick oakum. He is employed, on the contrary, in useful work, and this is why the Clairvaux prison has the aspect of a manufacturing town, iron furniture, picture frames, looking glasses, metric measures, velvet, linen, ladies' stays. Small things in mother of pearl, wooden shoes, and so on, being made by the nearly 1600 men who are kept there. Moreover, if the punishment for insubordination is very cruel, there is, at least, none of the flogging which goes on still in English prisons. Such a punishment would be absolutely impossible in France. Altogether, the central prison at Clairvaux may be described as one of the best penal institutions in Europe. And, with all that, the results obtained at Clairvaux are as bad as in any of the prisons of the old type. The watchword nowadays is that convicts are reformed in our prisons, one of the members of the prison administration once said to me. This is all nonsense, and I shall never be induced to tell such a lie. The pharmacy at Clairvaux was underneath the rooms which we occupied, and we occasionally had some contact with the prisoners who were employed in it. One of them was a grey-haired man in his, fifties, who ended his term while we were there. It was touching to learn how he parted with the prison. He knew that in a few months or weeks he would be back, and begged the doctor to keep the place at the pharmacy open for him. This was not his first visit to Clairvaux, and he knew it would not be the last. When he was set free he had not a soul in the world to whom he might go to spend his old age. Who will care to employ me, he said. And what trade have I? None. When I am out I must go to my old comrades, they, at least, will surely receive me as an old friend. Then would come a glass too much of drink in their company, excited talk about some capital fun, some new stroke to be made in the way of theft and, partly from weakness of will, partly to oblige his only friends, he would join in it. And would be locked up once more. So it had been several times before in his life. Two months passed, however, after his release, and he had not yet returned to Clairvaux. Then the prisoners, and the warders too, began to feel uneasy about him. Has he had time to move to another judicial district, that he is not yet back? One can only hope that he has not been involved in some bad affair, they would say, meaning something worse than theft. That would be a pity, he was such a nice, quiet man. But it soon appeared that the first supposition was the right one. Word came from another prison that the old man was locked up there, and was now endeavouring to be transferred to Clairvaux. The old men were the most pitiful sight. Many of them had begun their prison experience in childhood or early youth, others at a riper age. But, once in prison, always in prison, such is the saying derived from experience. And now, having reached or passed beyond the age of sixty, 
they knew that they must end their lives in prison. To quicken their departure from life the prison administration used to send them to the workshops where felt were made out of all sorts of woolen refuse. The dust in the workshop soon induced the consumption which released them. Then, four fellow prisoners would carry the old man to the common grave, the graveyard warder and his black dog being the only two beings to follow him. And while the prison priest marched in front of the procession mechanically reciting his prayer and looking at the chestnut or fir trees along the road, and the comrades carrying the coffin were enjoying the momentary freedom from confinement. The black dog would be the only being affected by the solemnity of the ceremony. When the reformed central prisons were introduced it was believed that the principle of absolute silence could be maintained in them. But it is so contrary human nature that its strict enforcement had to be abandoned. To the outward observer the prison seems to be quite mute, but in reality life goes on in it as busily as in a small town. In suppressed voices, by means of whispers, hurriedly dropped words, and scraps of notes, all news of any interest spreads immediately throughout the prison. Nothing can happen either among the prisoners themselves, or in the Cour d'Honneur, where the lodgings of the administration are situated, or in the village of Clairvaux, or in the wide world of Paris politics. That is not communicated at once throughout all the dormitories, workshops, and cells. Frenchmen are too communicative to admit of their underground telegraph ever being stopped. We had no intercourse with the common law prisoners, and yet we knew all the news of the day. John, the gardener, is back for two years. Such an inspector's wife has had a fearful scrimmage with so and so's wife. James in the cells has been caught transmitting a note of friendship to John of the farmer's workshop. That old beast so and so is no longer minister of justice. The ministry was upset, and so on, and when the word goes out that Jack has got two five-penny packets of tobacco in exchange for two flannel jackets, it makes the tour of the prison very quickly. On one occasion a petty lawyer, detained in the prison, wished to transmit to me a note, in order to ask my wife, who was staying in the village, to see from time to time his wife, who was also there. And quite a number of men took the liveliest interest in the transmission of that message which had to pass through I don't know how many hands before it reached me. When there was something that might especially interest us in a paper, this paper, in some unaccountable way, would reach us, wrapped about a little stone and thrown over the high wall. Confinement in a cell is no obstacle to communication. When we came to Clairvaux and were first lodged in the cellular quarter, it was bitterly cold in the cells, so cold, indeed, that I could hardly write, and when my wife, who was then at Paris, got my letter, she did not recognize my handwriting. The order came to heat the cells as much as possible, but do what they might, the cells remained as cold as ever. It appeared. Afterwards that all the hot air tubes were choked with scraps of paper, bites of notes, pen knives, and all sorts of small things which several generations of prisoners had concealed in the pipes. Martin, the same friend, of mine whom I have already mentioned, obtained permission to serve part of his time in cellular confinement. He preferred isolation to life in a room with a dozen others, and so went to a cell. To his great astonishment he found that he was not at all alone. The walls and the keyholes spoke. In a short time all the inmates of the cells knew who he was, and Lai had acquaintances all over the building. Quite a life goes on, as in a beehive, between the seemingly isolated cells, only that life often takes such a character as to make it belong entirely to the domain of psychopathy. Kraft Ebbing himself had no idea of the aspects it assumes with certain prisoners in solitary confinement. I will not repeat here what I have said in a book, in Russian and French prisons, which I published in England in 1886, soon after my release from Clairvaux, upon the moral influence of prisoners upon prisoners. But there is one thing which must be said. The prison population consists of heterogeneous elements. But, taking only those who are usually described as, the criminals, proper, and of whom we have heard so much lately from Lombroso his followers, what struck me most as regards them that the prisons, which are considered as preventive of antisocial deeds, are exactly the institutions for breeding them. Everyone knows that absence of education, dislike of regular work, 
physical incapability of sustained effort, misdirected love of adventure, gambling propensities, absence of energy, an untrained will. And carelessness about the happiness of others are the causes which bring this class of people before the courts. Now I was deeply impressed during my imprisonment by the fact that it is exactly these defects of human nature each one of them which the prison breeds in its inmates. And it is bound to breed them because it is a prison, and will breed them so long as it exists. Incarceration in a prison of necessity entirely destroys the energy of a man and annihilates his will. In prison life there is no room for exercising one's will, to possess one's own will in prison means surely to get into trouble. The will of the prisoner must be killed, and it is killed. Still less room is there for exercising one's natural sympathies, everything being done to prevent free contact with all those, outside and inside, with whom the prisoner may have feelings of sympathy. Physically and mentally he is rendered less and less capable of sustained effort, and if he has had already a dislike for regular work, a dislike is only the more increased during his prison years. If, before he first came to the prison, he was easily wearied by monotonous work which he could not do properly or had an antipathy to underpaid overwork, his dislike now becomes hatred. If he doubted about the social utility of current rules of morality, now after having cast a critical glance upon the official defenders of these rules, and learned his comrades' opinions of them, he openly throws these rules overboard. And if he has got into trouble in consequence of a morbid development of the passionate, sensual side of his nature, now, after having spent a number of years in prison, this morbid character is still more developed. In many cases to an appalling extent. In this last direction the most dangerous of all prison education is most effective. In Siberia I had men what sinks of filth and what hotbeds of, physical and moral deterioration the dirty, overcrowded, unreformed Russian prisons were. And at the age of nineteen I imagine that if there were less overcrowding in the rooms and a certain classification of the prisoners, and if healthy occupations were provided for them, the institution might be substantially improved. Now I had to part with these illusions. I could convince myself that as regards their effects upon the prisoners and their results for society at large, the best, reformed, prisons whether cellular or not are as bad as, or even worse than the dirty prisons of old. They do not reform the prisoners. On the contrary, in the immense, overwhelming majority of cases they exercise upon them the most deteriorating effect. The thief, the swindler, the rough, who has spent some years in a prison, comes out of it more ready than over to resume his former career, he is better prepared for it, he has learned to do it better. He is more embittered against society, and he finds a solid justification for being in revolt against its laws and customs. Necessarily, unavoidably, he is bound to sink deeper and deeper into the antisocial acts which first brought him before a law court. The offenses he will commit after his release will inevitably be graver than those which first got him into trouble, and he is doomed to finish his life in a prison or in a hard labor colony. In the above mentioned book, I said that prisons are universities of crime, maintained by the state. And now, thinking of it at fifteen years' distance, in the light of my subsequent experience, I can only confirm that statement of mine. Personally, I have no reason whatever to complain of the years I spent in a French prison. For an active and independent man the restraint of liberty and activity is in itself so great a privation that all the remainder all the petty miseries of prison life are not worth speaking of. Of course, when we heard of the active political life which was going on in France, we resented very much our forced inactivity. The end of the first year, especially during a gloomy winter, is always hard for the prisoner. And when spring comes, one feels more strongly than ever the want of liberty. When I saw from our windows the meadows assuming their green garb, and the hills covered with a spring haze, or when I saw a train flying into a dale between the hills. I certainly felt a strong desire to follow it and to breathe the air of the woods, or to be carried along with the stream of human life in a busy town. But one who casts his lot with an advanced party must be prepared to spend a number of years in prison, and he need not grudge it. He feels that even during his imprisonment he remains not quite an inactive part of the movement which spreads and strengthens the ideas that are dear to him. At Lyons, my comrades, my wife, 
and myself certainly found the warders a very rough set of men. But after a couple of encounters all was set right. Moreover the prison administration knew that we had the Paris press with us, and they did not want to draw upon themselves the thunders of Roquefort or the cutting criticisms of Clemenceau. And at Clairvaux there was no need of such restraint. All the administration had been renewed a few months before we came thither. A prisoner had been killed by warders in his cell, and his corpse had been hanged to simulate suicide. But this time the affair leaked out through the doctor, the governor was dismissed, and altogether a better tone prevailed in the prison. I took away from Clairvaux the best recollection of its governor, and altogether, while I was there, I more than once thought that, after all, men are often better than the institutions they belong to. But, having no personal griefs, I can all the more freely and most unconditionally condemn the institution itself as a survival from the dark past, wrong in its principles, and a source of immeasurable evils to society. One thing more I must mention, as it struck me perhaps even more forcibly than the demoralizing effects of prisons upon their inmates. What a nest of infection is every prison and even every law court for its neighborhood, for the people who live near it. Lombroso has made much of the criminal type, which he believes he has discovered amongst the inmates of the prisons. If he had made the same efforts to observe the people who hang about the law courts, detectives, spies, petty solicitors, informers, people preying upon the simpletons, and the like. He would probably have concluded that his criminal type has a far greater geographical extension than the prison walls. I never saw such a collection of faces of the lowest human type as I saw around and within the Palais de Justice at Lyons, certainly not within the prison walls of Clairvaux. Dickens and Cruikshank have immortalized a few of these types. But they represent quite a world which revolves about the law courts and infuses its infection far and wide around them. And the same is true of each central prison, like Clairvaux. It is an atmosphere of petty thefts, petty swindlings, spying and corruption of all sorts, which spreads like a blot of oil round the prison. I saw all this. And if before my condemnation I already knew that society is wrong in its present system of punishments, after I left Clairvaux I knew that it is not only wrong and unjust in this system, but that it is simply foolish when, in its partly unconscious and partly willful ignorance of realities, it maintains at its own expense these universities of corruption, under the illusion that they are necessary as a bridle to the criminal instincts of man. 14. Every revolutionist meets a number of spies and agents provocateurs in his way, and I have had my fair share of them. All governments spend considerable sums of money in maintaining this kind of reptile. However, they are mainly dangerous to young people only. One who has had some experience of life and men soon discovers that there is about these creatures something which puts him on his guard. They are recruited from the scum of society, amongst men of the lowest moral standard, and if one is watchful of the moral character of the men he meets with, he soon notices something in the manners of these pillars of society, which shocks him. And then he asks himself the question, what has brought this man to me? What in the world can he have in common with us? In most cases this simple question is sufficient to put one on his guard. When I first came to Geneva, the agent of the Russian government who had been commissioned to spy upon the refugees was well known to all of us. He went under the title of Count. But as he had no footman and no carriage on which to emblazon his coronet and arms, he had had them embroidered on a sort of mantle which covered his tiny dog. We saw him occasionally in the cafés, without speaking to him. He was, in fact, an innocent who simply bought in the kiosks all the publications of the exiles, very probably adding to them such comments as he thought would please his chiefs. Different men began to pour in, as Geneva began to fill up with refugees of the young generation, and yet, in one way or another, they also became known to us. When a stranger appeared on our horizon, he asked with the usual nihilist frankness about his past and his present prospects, and it soon appeared what sort of person he was. Frankness in mutual intercourse is altogether the best way for bringing about proper relations between men. In this case it was invaluable. Numbers of persons whom none of us had known or heard of in Russia, absolute strangers to the circles, came to Geneva, and many of them, a few days or even hours after their arrival, 
stood on the most friendly terms with the colony of refugees. But in some way or other the spies never succeeded in crossing the threshold of familiarity. A spy might name common acquaintances, he might give the best accounts, sometimes correct, of his past in Russia. He might possess in perfection the nihilist slang and manners, but he never could assimilate that sort of nihilist ethics which had grown up amongst the Russian youth, and this alone kept him at a distance from our colony. Spies can imitate anything else but ethics. When I was working with Reckless, there was at Clarence one such individual, from whom we all kept aloof. We knew nothing bad about him, but we felt that he was not ours, and as he tried only the more to penetrate into our society, we became suspicious of him. I never had said a word to him, and consequently he especially sought after me. Seeing that he could not approach me through the usual channels, he began to write me letters, giving me mysterious appointments for mysterious purposes in the woods and in similar places. For fun, I once accepted his invitation and went to the spot, with a good friend following me at a distance, but the man, who probably had a confederate, must have noticed that I was not alone, and did not appear. So I was spared the pleasure of ever saying to him a single word. Besides, I worked at that time so hard that every minute of my time was taken up either with the geography or Le Revolt, and I entered into no conspiracies. However, we learned later on that this man used to send to the third section detailed reports about the supposed conversations which he had had with me, my supposed confidences, and the terrible plots which I was manipulating at St. Petersburg, against the Tsar's life. All that was taken for ready money at St. Petersburg, and in Italy, too. When Caffiero was arrested one day in Switzerland, he was shown formidable reports of Italian spies, who warned their government that Caffiero and I, loaded with bombs, were going to enter Italy. The fact was that I never was in Italy and never had had any intention of visiting the country. In point of fact, however, the spies do not always make up reports out of whole cloth. They often tell things that are true, but all depends upon the way a story is told. We passed some most merry moments about a report which was addressed to the French government by a French spy who followed my wife and myself as we were traveling in 1881 from Paris to London. The spy, probably playing a double part, as is often done, had sold that report to Rockefeller, who published it in his paper. Everything that the spy had stated was correct, but the way he had told it. He wrote, for instance, I took the next compartment to the one that Kropotkin had taken with his wife. Quite true, he was there. We noticed him, for he had managed at once to attract our attention by his sullen, unpleasant face. They spoke Russian all the time, in order not to be understood by the passengers. Very true again, we spoke Russian, as we always do. When they came to Calais, they both took a bouillon. Most correct again, we took a bouillon. But here the mysterious part of the journey begins. After that, they both suddenly disappeared, and I looked for them in vain, on the platform and elsewhere. And when they reappeared, he was in disguise and was followed by a Russian priest, who never left him after that until they arrived in London, where I lost sight of the priest. All that was true again. My wife had a tooth slightly aching, and I asked the permission of the keeper of the restaurant to go to his private room, where my wife could ease her tooth. So we had disappeared, indeed. And as we had to cross the channel, I put my soft felt hat into my pocket and put on a fur cap, I was in disguise. As to the mysterious priest, he was also there. He was not a Russian, but that is irrelevant, he wore at any eight the dress of the Greek priests. I saw him standing at the counter and asking something which no one understood. Agua, agua, he repeated, in a woeful tone. Give the gentleman a glass of water, I said to the waiter. Whereupon the priest, struck by my wonderful linguistic capacities, began to thank me for my intervention with a truly eastern effusion. My wife took pity on him and spoke to him in different languages, but he understood none of them. It appeared at last that he knew a few words in one of the South Slavonian languages, and we could make out, Emma Greek, Turkish Embassy, London. We told him, mostly by signs, that we, too, were going to London, and that he might travel with us. 
The most amusing part of the story was that I really found for him the address of the Turkish embassy even before we had reached Charing Cross. The train stopped. At some station on the way, and two elegant ladies entered our already full third-class compartment. Both had newspapers in their hands. One was English, and the other a handsome woman, who spoke good French, pretended to be English. After exchanging a few words, the latter asked me a brule pourpont, what do you think of Count Ignatif? And immediately after that, are you soon going to kill the new Tsar? I was clear as to her profession from these two questions, but thinking of my priest, I said to her, do you happen to know the address of the Turkish embassy? Street so and so, number so and so, she replied without hesitation, like a schoolgirl in a class. You could, I suppose, also give the address of the Russian embassy. I asked her, and the address having been given with the same readiness, I communicated both to the priest. When we reached Charing Cross, the lady was so obsequiously anxious to attend to my luggage, and even to carry a heavy package herself with her gloved hands, that I finally told her, much to her surprise. Enough of this, ladies don't carry gentlemen's luggage. Go away. But to return to my trustworthy French spy. He alighted at Charing Cross, he wrote in his report, but for more than half an hour after the arrival of the train he did not leave the station, until he had ascertained that everyone else had left it. I kept aloof in the meantime, concealing myself behind a pillar. Having ascertained that all passengers had left the platform, they both suddenly jumped into a cab. I followed them nevertheless, and overheard the address which the cabman gave at the gate to the policeman, 12, street so and so, and ran after the cab. There were no cabs in the neighborhood, so I ran up to Trafalgar Square, where I got one. I then drove after him, and he alighted at the above address. Every fact of it is true again, the address and everything, but how mysterious it all reads. I had warned a Russian friend of my arrival, but there was a dense fog that morning, and he overslept. We waited for him half an hour, and then, leaving our luggage in the cloakroom, drove to his house. There they sat till two o'clock with drawn curtains, and then only a tall man came out of the house, and returned one hour later with their baggage. Even the remark about the curtains was correct. We had to light the gas on account of the fog, and drew down the curtains to get rid of the ugly fog sight of a small Islington street wrapped in a dense fog. When I was working with Ella Z. Reckless at Clarence, I used to go every fortnight to Geneva to see to the bringing out of Le Revolt. One day when I reached our printing office, I was told that a Russian gentleman wanted to see me. He had already seen my friends, and had told them that he came to induce me to start a paper, like Le Revolt, in Russian. He offered for that purpose all the money that might be required. I went to meet him in a cafe, where he gave me a German name, Tonlem, let us say, and told me that he was a native of the Baltic provinces. He boasted of possessing a large fortune in certain estates and manufactures, and he was extremely angry against the Russian government for their Russianizing schemes. On the whole he produced a somewhat indeterminate impression, so that my friends insisted upon my accepting his offer, but I did not much like the man from first sight. From the café he took me to his rooms in a hotel, and there he began to show less reserve, and to appear more like himself and still more unpleasant. Don't doubt my fortune, he said to me, I have also a capital invention. There's a lot of money in it. I shall patent it, and get a considerable sum of money for it, all for the cause of the revolution in Russia. And he showed me, to my astonishment, a miserable candlestick, the originality of which was that it was awfully ugly and had three bits of wire to put the candle in. The poorest housewife would not have cared for such a candlestick, and even if it could have been patented, no manufacturer would have paid the patentee more than ten dollars. A rich man placing his hopes on such a candlestick. This man, I thought to myself, can never have seen better ones, and my opinion about him was made up. He was no rich man at all, and the money he offered was not his own. So I bluntly told him, very well, if you are so anxious to have a Russian revolutionary paper, and hold the flattering opinion about myself that you have expressed, you will have to deposit your money in my name at a bank. And at my entire disposal. But I warn you that you will have absolutely nothing to do with the paper. 
Of course, of course, he said, but just see to it, and sometimes advise you, and aid you in smuggling it into Russia. No, nothing of the sort. You need not see me at all. My friends thought that I was too hard upon the man, but some time after that a letter was received from St. Petersburg warning us that we would receive the visit of a spy of the third section, Tolman by name. The candlestick had thus rendered us a good service. Whether by candlesticks or something else, these people almost always betray themselves in one way or another. When we were at London in 1881, we received on a foggy morning a visit from two Russians. I knew one of them by name, the other, a young man whom he recommended as his friend, was a stranger. The latter had volunteered to accompany his friend on a few days' visit to London. As he was introduced by a friend, I had no suspicions whatever about him. But I was very busy that day and asked another friend, who lived nearby, to find them a room and take them about to see London. My wife had not yet seen England either, and she went with them. In the afternoon she returned, saying to me, Do you know, I dislike that man very much. Beware of him. But why? What's the matter? I asked. Nothing, absolutely nothing, but he is surely not ours. By the way he treated the waiter in a cafe, and the way he handles money, I saw at once he is not ours, and if he is not, why should he come to us? She was so certain of the justice of her suspicions that while she performed her duties of hospitality she nevertheless managed never to leave that young man alone in my study even for one minute. We had a chat, and the visitor began to exhibit himself more and more under such a low moral aspect that even his friend blushed for him, and when I asked more details about him, the explanations they both gave were still less satisfactory. We were both on our guard. In short, they left London in a couple of days, and a fortnight later I got a letter from my Russian friend, full of excuses for having introduced the young man, who, they had found out at Paris, was a spy in the service of the Russian embassy. I looked then into a list of Russian secret service agents in France and Switzerland, which we refugees had received lately from the executive committee, they had their men everywhere at St. Petersburg, and I found the name of that young man on the list, with one letter only altered in it. To start a paper, subsidized by the police, with a police agent at its head, is an old plan, and the prefect of the Paris police, Andrius, resorted to it in 1881. I was staying with Elise Reckless in the mountains, when we received a letter from a Frenchman, or rather a Belgian, who announced to us that he was going to start an anarchist paper at Paris, and asked our collaboration. The letter, full of flatteries, produced upon us an unfavorable impression, and Reckless had, moreover, some vague recollection of having heard the name of the writer in some unfavorable connection. We decided to refuse collaboration, and I wrote to a Paris friend that we must first of all ascertain whence the money came with which the paper was going to be started. It might come from the Orleanists, an old trick of the family, and we must know its origin. My Paris friend, with a workman's straightforwardness, read that letter at a meeting at which the would-be editor of the paper was present. He simulated offense, and I had to answer several letters on this subject, but I stuck to my words, if the man is in earnest, he must show us the origin of the money. And so he did at last. Pressed by questions, he said that the money came from his aunt, a rich lady of antiquated opinions, who yielded, however, to his fancy of having a paper, and had parted with the money. The lady was not in France, she was staying at London. We insisted nevertheless upon having her name and address, and our friend Malatesta volunteered to see her. He went with an Italian friend who was connected with the second-hand trade in furniture. They found the lady occupying a small flat, and while Malatesta spoke to her and was more and more convinced that she was simply playing the aunt's part in the comedy, the furniture friend, looking round at the chairs and tables, discovered that all of them had been taken the day before, probably hired, from a second-hand furniture dealer, his neighbor. The labels of the dealer were still fastened to the chairs and the tables. This did not prove much, but naturally reinforced our suspicions. I absolutely refused to have anything to do with the paper. The paper was of an unheard of violence. Burning, assassination, dynamite bombs, there was nothing but that in it. 
I met the man, the editor of the paper, when I went to the London Congress, and the moment I saw his sullen face and heard a bit of his talk and caught a glimpse of the sort of women with whom he always went about. My opinions concerning him were settled. At the Congress, during which he introduced all sorts of terrible resolutions, all present kept aloof from him. And when he insisted upon having the addresses of all anarchists throughout the world, the refusal was made in anything but a flattering manner. To make a long story short, he was unmasked a couple of months later, and the paper was stopped forever on the very next day. Then, a couple of years after that, the prefect of police, Andrius, published his memoirs, and in this book he told all about the paper which he had started, and the explosions which his agents had organized at Paris. By putting sardine boxes filled with something under the statue of Thiers. One can imagine the quantities of money all these things cost the French and other nations. I might write several chapters on this subject, but I will mention only one more story, of two adventurers at Clairvaux. My wife stayed in the only inn of the little village which has grown up under the shadow of the prison wall. One day the landlady entered her room with a message from two gentlemen, who came to the hotel and wanted to see my wife. The landlady interceded with all her eloquence in their favor. Oh, I know the world, she raved, and I assure you, madam, that they are the most correct gentlemen. Nothing could be more come ill foe. One of them gave the name of a German officer. He is surely a baron, or a come lord, and the other is his interpreter. They know you perfectly well. The baron is going now to Africa, perhaps never to return, and he wants to see you before he leaves. My wife looked at the visiting card, which bore a Madame la Principesse Kropit Keen. Quand voir, and needed no more commentaries about the cum fifo of the two gentlemen. As to the contents of the message, they were even worse than the address. Against all rules of grammar and common sense the Baron wrote about a mysterious communication which he had to make. She refused point-blank to receive the writer and his interpreter. Thereupon the Baron wrote to my wife letter upon letter, which she returned without opening them. All the village soon became divided into two parties, one siding with the Baron and led by the landlady, the other against him and headed, as a matter of fact, by the landlady's husband. Quite a romance was circulated. The Baron had known my wife before her marriage. He had danced with her many times at the Russian embassy in Vienna. He was still in love with her, but she, the cruel one, refused even to allow him a glimpse of her before he went upon his perilous expedition. Then came the mysterious story of a boy, whom we were said to conceal. Where is their boy? The Baron wanted to know. They have a son, six years old by this time, where is he? She never would part with a boy if she had one, the one party said. Yes, they have one, but they conceal him, the other party maintained. For us too this contest contained a very interesting revelation. It proved to us that my letters were not only read by the prison authorities, but that their contents were made known to the Russian embassy as well. When I was at Lyons, and my wife had gone to Ace LZ Reckless in Switzerland, she wrote to me once that, our boy, was getting on very well, his health was excellent, and they all spent a very nice evening at the anniversary of his fifth birthday. I knew that she meant, Le Revolt, which we often used to name in conversations, our gammon, our naughty boy. But now that these gentlemen were inquiring about, our gammon, and even designated so correctly his age, it was evident that the letter had passed through other hands than those of the governor. It was well to know this. Nothing escapes the attention of village folk in the country, and the baron soon awakened suspicions. He wrote a new letter to my wife, even more wordy than the former ones. Now he asked her pardon for having tried to introduce himself as an acquaintance. He owned that she did not know him, but nevertheless he was a well-wisher. He had a most important communication to make to her. My life was in danger, and he wanted to warn her. The baron and his secretary took an outing in the fields to read this letter together and to consult about its tenor, the forest guard following them at a distance. But they quarreled about it, and the letter was torn to pieces and thrown on the ground. The forester waited till they were out of sight, gathered the pieces, connected them, and read the letter. 
In an hour's time the village knew that the baron had never really been acquainted with my wife, the romance which was so sentimentally repeated by the baron's party crumbled to pieces. Ah, then they are not what they pretended to be, the brigadier de gendarmerie concluded in his turn, then they must be German spies, and he arrested them. It must be said in his behalf that a German spy had really been at Clairvaux shortly before. In time of war the vast buildings of the prison might serve as depots for provisions or barracks for the army, and the German general staff was surely interested to know the inner capacity of the prison buildings. Accordingly a jovial traveling photographer came to our village, made friends with everyone by photographing all of them for nothing, and was admitted to photograph not only the inside of the prison yards, but also the dormitories. Having done this, he traveled to some other town on the eastern frontier, and was there arrested by the French authorities, as a man found in possession of compromising military documents. The brigadier, fresh from the impression of that visit, jumped to the conclusion that the baron and his secretary were also German spies, and took them in custody to the little town of bar sur -Aube. There they were released next morning, the local paper stating that they were not German spies, but persons commissioned by another more friendly power. Now public opinion turned entirely against the baron and his secretary, who had to live through more adventures. After their release they entered a small village café, and there ventilated their griefs in German in a friendly conversation over a bottle of wine. You were stupid, you were a coward, the self-styled interpreter said to the self-styled baron. If I had been in your place, I would have shot that examining magistrate with this revolver. Let him only repeat that with me, he will have these bullets in his head. And so on. A commercial traveller who sat quietly in a corner of the room rushed at once to the brigadier to report the conversation which he had overheard. The brigadier made an official report immediately, and again arrested the secretary, a pharmacist from Strasbourg. He was taken before a police court at the same town of bar sur -Aube, and got a full month's imprisonment for menaces uttered against a magistrate in a public place. After that the baron had more adventures, and the village did not resume its usual quietness till after the departure of the two strangers. I have here related only a very few of the spy stories that I might tell. But when one thinks of the thousands of villains going about the world in the pay of all governments, and very often well paid for their villainies, of the traps they lay for all sorts of artless people. Of the vast sums of money thrown away in the maintenance of that army, which is recruited in the lowest strata of society and from the population of the prisons, of the corruption of all sorts which they pour into society at large, nay, even into families, one cannot but be appalled at the immensity of the evil which is thus done. 15. Demands for our release were continually raised, both in the press and in the chamber of deputies, the more so as about the same time that we were condemned Louise Michel was condemned, too, for robbery. Louise Michel who always gives literally her last shawl or cloak to the woman who is in need of it, and who never could be compelled, during her imprisonment, to have better food than her fellow prisoners. Because she always gave them what was sent to her, was condemned, together with another comrade, Puget, to nine years imprisonment for highway robbery. That sounded too bad even for the middle-class opportunists. She marched one day at the head of a procession of the unemployed, and, entering a baker's shop, took a few loaves from it and distributed them to the hungry column, this was her robbery. The release of the anarchists thus became a war cry against the government, and in the autumn of 1885 all my comrades save three were set at liberty by a decree of President Grevy. Then the outcry in behalf of Louise Michel and myself became still louder. However, Alexander III objected to it, and one day the Prime Minister, M. Freysenet, answering an interpolation in the chamber, said that diplomatic difficulties stood in the way of Kropotkin's release. Strange words in the mouth of the Prime Minister of an independent country. But still stranger words have been heard since in connection with that ill omened alliance of France with Imperial Russia. In the middle of January, 1886, both Louise Michel and Puget, as well as the four of us who were still at Clairvaux, were set free. My release meant also the release of my wife from her voluntary imprisonment in the little village at the prison gates, which began to tell upon her health, and we went to Paris to stay there for a few weeks with our friend, Ellie Reckless. 
a writer of great power in anthropology, who is often mistaken outside France for his younger brother, the geographer, Elise. A close friendship has united the two brothers from early youth. When the time came for them to enter a university, they went together from a small country place in the valley of the Gironde to Strasbourg, making the journey on foot accompanied, like true wandering students, by their dog. And when they stayed at some village, it was the dog which got the bowl of soup, while the two brothers' supper very often consisted only of bread with a few apples. From Strasbourg the younger brother went to Berlin, whither he was attracted by the lectures of the great Ritter. Later on, in the forties, they were both at Paris. Elie Reckless became a convinced Fourierist, and both saw in the Republic of 1848 the coming of a new era of social evolution. Consequently, after Napoleon III's coup d'état they both had to leave France, and emigrated to England. When the amnesty was voted, and they returned to Paris, Elie edited their a Fourierist cooperative paper, which circulated widely among the workers. It is not generally known, but may be interesting to note, that Napoleon III, who played the part of a Caesar, interested, as behooves a Caesar, in the conditions of the working classes, used to send one of his aides de camp to the printing office of the paper each time it was printed. To take to the Tilleries the first sheet issued from the press. He was, later on, even ready to patronize the International Workingmen's Association, on the condition that it should put in one of its reports a few words of confidence in the great socialist plans of the Caesar. And he ordered its prosecution when the internationalists refused point blank to do anything of the sort. When the commune was proclaimed, both brothers heartily joined it, and Elie accepted the post of keeper of the National Library and the Louvre Museum under Valiant. It was, to a great extent, to his foresight and to his work that we owe the preservation of the invaluable assures of human knowledge and art accumulated in these two institutions. During the bombardment of Paris by the armies of Thiers and the subsequent conflagration, a passionate lover of Greek art, and profoundly acquainted with it, he had had all the most precious statues and vases of the Louvre packed and placed in the vaults. While the greatest precautions were taken to store in a safe place the most precious books of the National Library, and to protect the building from the conflagration which raged round it. His wife, a courageous woman, a worthy companion of the philosopher, followed in the streets by her two little boys, organized in the meantime in her own quarter of the town a system of feeding the people, who had been reduced to sheer destitution during the second siege. In the last few weeks of its existence the commune finally realized that a supply of food for the people, who were deprived of the means of earning it for themselves, ought to have been the commune's first care, and volunteers organized the relief. It was by mere accident that Elie Reckless, who had kept to his post till the last moment, escaped being shot by the Versailles troops. And a sentence of deportation having been pronounced upon him for having dared to accept so necessary a service under the commune, he went with his family into exile. Now, on his return to Paris, he had resumed the work of his life, ethnology. What this work is may be judged from a few, a very few chapters of it, published in book form under the titles of Primitive Folk and The Australians, as well as from the history of the origin of religions, which forms the substance of his lectures at the École de Hautes Etudes, at Brussels, a foundation of his brother. In the whole range of ethnological literature there are not many works imbued to the same extent with a thorough and sympathetic understanding of the true nature of primitive man. As to his history of religions, part of which was published in the review Société Nouvelle, and which is now being continued in its successor, Humanite Nouvelle, it is, I venture to say, the best work on the subject that has yet appeared. Undoubtedly superior to Herbert Spencer's attempt in the same direction, because Herbert Spencer, with all his immense intellect, does not possess that understanding of the artless and simple nature of the primitive man which Elie Reckless possesses to a rare perfection, and to which he has added an extremely wide knowledge of a rather neglected branch of folk psychology. The Evolution and Transformation of Beliefs It is needless to speak of Elie Reckless' infinite good nature and modesty, or of his superior intelligence and vast knowledge of all subjects relating to humanity, it is all comprehended in his style, which is his and no one else's. With his modesty, his calm manner, and his deep philosophical insight, he is the type of the Greek philosopher of antiquity. 
In a society less fond of patented tuition and of piecemeal instruction, and more appreciative of the development of wide humanitarian conceptions, he would be surrounded by flocks of pupils, like one of his Greek prototypes. A very animated socialist and anarchist movement was going on at Paris while we stayed there. Louise Michel lectured every night, and aroused the enthusiasm of her audiences, whether they consisted of workingmen or were made up of middle-class people. Her already great popularity became still greater, and spread even amongst the university students, who might hate advanced ideas, but worshipped in her the ideal woman. While I was at Paris a riot, caused by someone speaking disrespectfully to Louise Michel in the presence of students, took place in a café the young men took up her defense and made a great uproar, smashing all the tables and glasses in the café. I also lectured once, on anarchism, before an audience of several thousand people, and left Paris immediately after that lecture, before the government could obey the injunctions of the reactionary and pro-Russian press, which insisted upon my being expelled from France. From Paris we went to London, where I found once more my two old friends, Stepniak and Tchaikovsky. Life in London was no more the dull, vegetating existence that it had been for me four years before. We settled in a small cottage at Harrow. We cared little about the furniture of the cottage, a good part of which I made myself with, the aid of Tchaikovsky he had been in the United States and had learned some carpentering. But we rejoiced immensely at having a small plot of heavy Middlesex clay in our garden. My wife and I went with much enthusiasm into gardening, the admirable results of which I had before realized after having made acquaintance with the writings of Tubo and some Paris market gardeners. And after our own experiment in the prison garden at Clairvaux. As for my wife, who had typhoid fever soon after we settled at Harrow, the work in the garden during the period of convalescence was more completely restorative than a stay at the very best sanatorium would have been. Near the end of the summer a heavy blow fell upon me. I learned that my brother Alexander was no longer living. During the years that I had been abroad before my imprisonment in France we had never corresponded with each other. In the eyes of the Russian government, to love a brother who is persecuted for his political opinions is itself a sin. To maintain relations with him after he has become a refugee is a crime. A subject of the Tsar must hate all the rebels against the supreme ruler's authority, and Alexander was in the clutches of the Russian police. I persistently refused, therefore, to write to him or to any other of my relatives. After the Tsar had written on the petition of our sister Helene, let him remain there, there was no hope of a speedy release for my brother. Two years after that a committee was nominated to settle terms for those who had been exiled to Siberia without judgment, for an undetermined time, and my brother got five years. That made seven, with the two which he had already been kept there. Then a new committee was nominated under Loris Melikov, and added another five years. My brother was thus to be liberated in October, 1886. That made twelve years of exile, first in a tiny town of East Siberia, and afterwards at Tomsk, that is, in the lowlands of West Siberia, where he had not even the dry and healthy climate of the high prairies further east. When I was imprisoned at Clairvaux he wrote to me, and we exchanged a few letters. He wrote that though our letters would be read by the Russian police in Siberia, and by the French prison authorities in France, we might as well write to each other even under this double supervision. He spoke of his family life, of his three children, whom he described interestingly, and of his work. He earnestly advised me to keep a watchful eye upon the development of science in Italy, where excellent and original researches are conducted, but remain unknown in the scientific world until they have been exploited in Germany. And he gave me his opinions about the probable progress of political life in Russia. He did not believe in the possibility with us, in a near future, of constitutional rule on the pattern of the West European parliaments. But he looked forward and found it quite sufficient for the moment to the convocation of a sort of deliberative national assembly, Zemesky Sabor or Etats General. It would not make laws, but would only work out the schemes of laws, to which the imperial power and the council of state would give definitive form and final sanction. Above all he wrote to me about his scientific work. He had always had a decided leaning towards astronomy, 
and when we were at St. Petersburg he had published in Russian an excellent summary of all our knowledge of the shooting stars. With his fine critical mind he soon saw the strong or the weak points of different hypotheses. And without sufficient knowledge of mathematics, but endowed with a powerful imagination, he succeeded in grasping the results of the most intricate mathematical researches. Living with his imagination amongst the moving celestial bodies, he realized their complex movements often better than some mathematicians, especially the pure algebraists, who are apt to lose sight of the realities of the physical world and see nothing but their own formulae. Our St. Petersburg astronomers spoke to me with great appreciation of that work of my brothers. Now, he undertook to study the structure of the universe. To analyze the data and the hypotheses about the worlds of suns, star clusters, and nebulae in the infinite space, and to work out the problems of their grouping, their life, and the laws of their evolution and decay. The Polkova astronomer, Gildan, spoke highly of this new work of Alexander's, and introduced him by correspondence to Mr. Holden in the United States, from whom, while at Washington lately, I had the pleasure of hearing an appreciative estimate of the value of these researches. Science is greatly in need, from time to time, of such scientific speculations of a higher standard, made by a scrupulously laborious, critical, and, at the same time, imaginative mind. But in a small town of Siberia, far away from all the libraries, unable to follow the progress of science, he had only succeeded in embodying in his work the researches which had been made up to the date of his exile. Some capital work had been done since. He knew it, but how could he get access to the necessary books, so long as he remained in Siberia? The approach of the time of his liberation did not inspire him with hope either. He knew that he would not be allowed to stay in any of the university towns of Russia, or of Western Europe, but that his exile to Siberia would be followed by a second exile, perhaps even worse than the first, to some hamlet of eastern Russia. A despair like Faust's takes hold of me at times, he wrote to me. When the time of his liberation was at hand, he sent his wife and children to Russia, taking advantage of one of the last steamers before the close of navigation, and, on a gloomy night, this despair put an end to his life. A dark cloud hung upon our cottage for many months, until a flash of light pierced it, when, the next spring, a tiny being, a girl who bears my brother's name, came into the world, and with her helpless cry set new strings vibrating in my heart. 16. In 1886 the socialist movement in England was in full swing. Large bodies of workers had openly joined it in all the principal towns, as well as a number of middle-class people, chiefly young, who helped it in different ways. An acute industrial crisis prevailed that year in most trades, and every morning, and often all the day long, I heard groups of workers going about in the streets singing, We've got no work to do, or some hymn, and begging for bread. People flocked at night into Trafalgar Square, to sleep there in the open air, in the wind and in the rain, between two newspapers. And one day in February a crowd, after having listened to the speeches of Burns, Hindman, and Champion, rushed into Piccadilly and broke a few windows in the great shops. Far more important, however, than this outbreak of discontent was the spirit which prevailed amongst the poorer portion of the working population in the outskirts of London. It was such that if the leaders of the movement, who were prosecuted for the riots, had received severe sentences, a spirit of hatred and revenge, hitherto unknown in the recent history of the labor movement in England. But the symptoms of which were very well marked in 1886, would have been developed, and would have impressed its stamp upon the subsequent movement for a long time to come. However, the middle classes seemed to have realized the danger. Considerable sums of money were immediately subscribed in the West End for the relief of misery in the East End, certainly quite inadequate to relieve a widely spread destitution, but sufficient to show, at least, good intentions. As to the sentences which were passed upon the prosecuted leaders, they were limited to two or three months' imprisonment. The amount of interest in socialism and all sorts of schemes of reform and reconstruction of society was very great among all classes of people. Beginning with the autumn and throughout all the winter I was asked to lecture all over the country, partly on prisons but mainly on anarchist socialism, and I visited in this way nearly every large town of England and Scotland. 
As a rule I accepted the first invitation I received for entertainment on the night of the lecture, and consequently it happened that I stayed one night in a rich man's mansion, and the next in the narrow quarters of a working family. Every night I saw considerable numbers of people of all classes. And whether it was in the workers' small parlor, or in the reception room of the wealthy, the most animated discussions went on about socialism and anarchism till a late hour with hope in the workman's house, with apprehension in the mansion. But everywhere with the same earnestness. In the mansion the main questions asked were, what do the socialists want? What do they intend to do, and next, what are the concessions which it is absolutely necessary to make at some given moment in order to avoid serious conflicts? In our conversations I seldom heard the justice of the socialist contention simply denied, or described as sheer nonsense. But I found a firm conviction that a revolution was impossible in England. That the claims of the mass of the workers had not yet reached the precision or the extent of the claims of the socialists, and that the workers would be satisfied with much less. So that secondary concessions, amounting to a prospect of a slight increase of well-being or of leisure, would be accepted by the working classes of England as a pledge, in the meantime, of still more in the future. We are a left-center country. We live by compromise. I was once told by an aged member of parliament who had had a wide experience of the life of his mother country. In workmen's dwellings, too, I noticed a difference in the questions which were addressed to me in England from those which I was asked on the continent. General principles, of which the partial applications will be determined by the principles themselves, deeply interest the Latin workers. If this or that municipal council votes funds in support of a strike, or provides for the feeding of the children at the schools, no importance is attached to such steps. They are taken as a matter of fact. Of course a hungry child cannot learn, a French worker says, it must be fed. Of course the employer was wrong in forcing the workers to strike. That is all that is said, and no praise is given to such minor concessions by the present individualist society to communist principles. The thought of the worker goes beyond the period of such concessions, and he asks whether it is the commune or the unions of workers, or the state which ought to undertake the organization of production. Whether free agreement alone will be sufficient to maintain society in working order, and what could be the moral restraint if society parted with its present repressive agencies. Whether an elected democratic government would be capable of accomplishing serious changes in the socialist direction, and whether accomplished facts ought not to precede legislation, and so on. In England, it was upon a series of palliative concessions, gradually growing in importance, that the chief weight was laid. But on the other hand the impossibility of state administration of industries seemed to have been settled long before in the workers' minds, while what chiefly interested most of them was matters of constructive realization. As well as how to attain the conditions which would make such a realization possible. Well, Kropotkin, suppose that tomorrow we were to take possession of the docks of our town. What's your idea about how to manage them, would be asked, for instance, as soon as we had sat down in a working men's parlor. Or, we don't like the idea of state management of railways, and the present management by private companies is organized robbery. But suppose the workers own all the railways. How could the working of them be organized? The lack of general ideas was thus supplemented by a desire of going deeper into the details of the realities. Another feature of the movement in England was the considerable number of middle-class people who gave it their support in different ways some of them frankly joining it, while others helped it from the outside. In France and in Switzerland the two parties workers and the middle classes stood arrayed against each other, sharply separated from each other. So it was, at least, in the years 1876-85. When I was in Switzerland I could say that during my three or four years stay in the country. I was acquainted with none but workers. I hardly knew more than a couple of middle class men. In England this would have been impossible. We found quite a number of middle class men and who did not hesitate to appear openly, both in London and in the provinces, as helpers organizing socialist meetings, or in going about during a strike with boxes to collect coppers in the parks. Besides, we saw a movement similar to what we had had in Russia in the early 70s, when our youth rushed, to the people, 
though by no means so intense, so full of self-sacrifice, and so utterly devoid of the idea of charity. Here also, in England, a considerable number of people went in all sorts of capacities to live near the workers, in the slums, in people's palaces, in Toynbee Hall, and the like. It must be said that there was a great deal of enthusiasm at that time. Many probably thought that a social revolution had already commenced. As always happens, however, with such enthusiasts, when they saw that that in England, as everywhere, there was a long, tedious, preparatory uphill work to be done, very many of them retired from active work. And now stand outside of it as mere sympathetic onlookers. 17. I took a lively part in this movement, and with a few English comrades I started, in addition to the three socialist papers already in existence, an anarchist communist monthly, Freedom, which continues to live up to tile present hour. At the same time I resumed my work on anarchism where I had had to interrupt it at the time of my arrest. The critical part of it was published by Elise Recius, during my Clairvaux imprisonment, under the title, Paroles d'un Revolt. Now I began to work out the constructive part of an anarchist communist society, so far as it could be forecast, in a series of articles published at Paris in La Revolte. Our boy, prosecuted for anti-militarist propaganda, had been compelled to change its title page, and now appeared under a feminine name. Later on these articles were published in a more elaborate form in a book, La Conquite du Pain. These researches caused me to study more thoroughly certain points in the economic life of the civilized nations of today. Most socialists had hitherto said that in our present civilized societies we actually produce much more than is necessary for guaranteeing full well-being to all, that it was only the distribution which was defective. And, if a social revolution took place, all that was required would be for everyone to return to his factory or workshop, society taking possession for itself of the surplus value, or benefits which now went to the capitalist. I thought, on the contrary, that under the present conditions of private ownership production itself had taken a wrong turn, and was entirely inadequate even as regards the very necessaries of life. None of these necessaries are produced in greater quantities than would be required to secure well-being for all. And the overproduction, so often spoken of, means nothing but that the masses are too poor to buy even what is now considered as necessary for a decent existence. But in all civilized countries the production, both agricultural and industrial, ought to and easily might be immensely increased, so as to secure a reign of plenty for all. This brought me to consider the possibilities of modern agriculture, as well as those of an education which would give to everyone the possibility of carrying on at the same time both enjoyable manual work and brain work. I developed these ideas in a series of articles in the 19th century, which are now published as a book under the title of Fields Factories and Workshops. Another great question also engrossed my attention. It is known to what conclusions Darwin's formula, that a struggle for existence, had been developed by his followers generally, even the most intelligent of them, such as Huxley. There is no infamy in civilized society, or in the relations of the whites towards the so-called lower races, or of the strong towards the weak, which would not have found its excuse in this formula. Even during my stay at Clairvaux I saw the necessity of completely revising the formula itself and its applications to human affairs. The attempts which had been made by a few socialists in this direction did not satisfy me, but I found in a lecture by a Russian zoologist, Professor Kessler a true expression of the law of struggle for life. Mutual aid, he said in that lecture, is as much a law of nature as mutual struggle, but for the progressive evolution of the species the former is far more important than the latter. These few words confirmed unfortunately by only a couple of illustrations, to which Syvertsov, the zoologist of whom I have spoken in an earlier chapter, added one or two more, contained for me the key of the whole problem. When Huxley published in 1888 his atrocious article, The Struggle for Existence. A program, I decided to put in a readable form my objections to his way of understanding the struggle for life, among animals as well as among men, the materials for which I had been accumulating for two years. I spoke of it to my friends. However, I found that the interpretation of, struggle for life, in the sense of a war cry of, woe to the weak, raised to the height of a commandment of nature revealed by science. 
was so deeply rooted in this country that it had become almost a matter of religion. Two persons only supported me in my revolt against this misinterpretation of the facts of nature. The editor of the 19th century, Mr. James Knowles, with his admirable perspicacity, at once seized the gist of the matter, and with a truly youthful energy encouraged me to take it in hand. The other supporter was the regretted H. W. Bates, whom Darwin, in his autobiography, described as one of the most intelligent men he ever met. He was secretary of the Geographical Society, and I knew him, so I spoke to him of my intention. He was delighted with it. Yes, most assuredly right it, he said. That is true Darwinism. It is a shame to think of what they have made of Darwin's ideas. Write it, and when you have published it, I will write you a letter of commendation which you may publish. I could not have had better encouragement, and I began the work, which was published in the 19th century under the titles of Mutual Aid Among Animals, Among Savages, Among Barbarians, in the Medieval City, and Amongst Ourselves. Unfortunately I neglected to submit to Bates the first two articles of this series, Dealing with Animals, which were published during his lifetime, I hope to be soon ready with the second part of the work, Mutual Aid Among Men. But it took me several years to complete it, and in the meantime Bates passed from among us. The researches which I had to make during these studies, in order to acquaint myself with the institutions of the barbarian period and with those of the medieval one free cities, led me to another important research, the part played in history by the state during its latest manifestation in Europe, in the last three centuries. And on the other hand, the study of the mutual support institutions at different stages of civilization led me to examine the evolutionist basis of the senses of justice and morality in man. Within the last ten years the growth of socialism in England has taken on a new aspect. Those who judge only by the numbers of socialist and anarchist meetings held in the country, and the audiences attracted by these meetings are prone to conclude that socialist propaganda is now on the decline. And those who judge the progress of it by the numbers of votes that are given to those who claim to represent socialism in Parliament jump to the conclusion that there is now hardly any socialist work going on in England. But the depth and the penetration of the socialist ideas can nowhere be judged by the numbers of votes given in favor of those who bring more or less socialism into their electoral programs. Especially is this the case in England. The fact is, that of the three systems of socialism which were formulated by Fourier, St. Simon, and Robert Owen, it is the last named which prevails in England and Scotland. Consequently it is not so much by the number of meetings or of socialist votes that the intensity of the movement must be judged, but by the infiltration of the socialist point of view into the trade unionist, the cooperative. And the so-called municipal socialist movements, as well as the general infiltration of socialist ideas all over the country. Under this aspect, the extent to which the socialist views have penetrated is immense in comparison with what it was in 1886, and I do not hesitate to say that it is simply colossal in comparison with what it was in the years 1876-82. And I may also add that the persevering endeavors of the small anarchist groups have contributed, to an extent which makes us feel that we have not wasted our time, to spread the ideas of no government, of the rights of the individual, of local action and free agreement, as against those of state supremacy, centralization, and discipline, which were dominant twenty years ago. All Europe is now going through a very bad phase of the development of the military spirit. This was an unavoidable consequence of the victory obtained by the German military empire, with its universal military service system, over France in 1871, and it was already then foreseen, and foretold by many. In an especially impressive form by Bakunin. But the countercurrent already begins to make itself felt in modern life. Communist ideas, divested of their monastic form, have penetrated in Europe and America to an immense extent during the 27 years in which I have taken an active part in the socialist movement and could observe their growth. When I think of the vague, confused, timid ideas which were expressed by the workers at the first congresses of the International Workingmen's Association, or which were current at Paris during the Commune insurrection. Even among the most thoughtful of the leaders, 
and compare them with those which have been arrived at today by a vast number of workers, I must say that they seem to me to belong to two entirely different worlds. There is no period in history with the exception, perhaps, of the period of the insurrections in the 12th and 13th centuries, which led to the birth of the medieval communes during which a similarly deep change has taken place in the current conceptions of society. And now, in my 57th year, I am even more deeply convinced than I was 25 years ago that a chance combination of accidental circumstances may bring about in Europe a revolution as widespread as that of 1848, and far more important. Not in the sense of mere fighting between different parties, but in the sense of a profound and rapid social reconstruction. And I am convinced that whatever character such a movement may take in different countries, there will be displayed everywhere a far deeper comprehension of the required changes than has ever been displayed within the last six centuries. While the resistance which the movement will meet in the privileged classes will hardly have the character of obtuse obstinacy which made the revolutions of times past so violent. To obtain this great result is well worth the efforts which so many thousands of men and women of all nations and all classes have made within the last thirty years. The End